What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to the Courts Outside Off Podcast. Once again, I'm Josh Shivanoff. As always, welcome by the one and only man of the hour, too sweet to be sour, future Jiu-Jitsu world champion, Angel Ortega. We got a lot of stuff on the docket today, boys. We got UFC 290 to go over, UC Vegas 77, which is going down this Saturday, as well as a boatload of news, multiple heavyweight fights announced, one in boxing, one in, one in MMA. Uh, before we get into that news and uh, obviously previews and recaps, I want to go ahead and shout out to sponsors of the show, Rogue Energy and Elixir. That's code sound for both of those. Rogue Energy keep me fueled up, keep me going through my day, no matter what type of day I'm having. Yesterday, you know what? Super busy. You know, I had to had to take some animals to the vet, had to had to run around, had to hit the gym. I was very very busy. But you know what? Rogue Energy helped me, keep me fueled up, made it all happen. And they can also help you with code sound for ten percent off at checkout. Elixir is the exact opposite end. If you want some Delta 8, 9, 10, AGC quality products, go over there, elixir.com, code SOUNDOFF for 10% off, get you very calm, get you very high. And once again, code SOUNDOFF, code SOUNDOFF for both sponsors. Last Saturday night from the T-Mobile Arena in Las Vegas, Nevada, International Fight, we came to a head, UFC 290, and uh, Angel, dude, one of the greatest UC cards of all time. I, I got to just ask, before we even break into the recaps and start talking about the fights themselves, where does this kind of roughly stat rank all time? I saw some people comparing it to UFC 217, comparing it to UFC 100, comparing it to a lot of these incredible cards over time. Where does this kind of rank in history for you? It has to be up there, right? Like, you have to have rate it highly. It had everything from... Storylines to great fights to quick finishes to short notice fights uh to upsets. What else do you want? You know, it was it was just a perfect uh mixture of everything, and it was International Fight Week. You had a uh, kind of a, there was there was someone representing every part of the world. But you had African fighters, you had Australian fighters, you had American fighters, you had South American fighters. You had everything that you could have wanted on this card and more. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man. I mean, for me personally, I I got done with the card. I was like, dude, that is just, I mean, it's in the, it's probably, it's top five, I think, probably for me all time. I mean, off, off the top of my head, just a couple of other ones, obviously. I was a big fan of UC 217. UC 189 was a banger. Um, that was the, the Connor, you know, Mendez one with Rory and Robbie. Um, UC 206 is a personal one of mine that I really, really like, you know. Um, but there's tons of good ones, and this is, it's going to go down as one of the all-time greatest cards in, in mixed martial arts history, especially UFC history. Um, but nonetheless, dude, in the main event, Alexander the Great Volkanovsky, dude, he made it look easy. He looks like a man amongst boys in the featherweight division. He gets a third-round knockout win over Yair Rodriguez. He hurt him with just some this is a little minor thing i got to throw in there. Volkanovsky, Angel, there are few things more beautiful in MMA than Volkanovsky switching stance. Because he nails you with a little a little check hook coming in. And that's the way that he hurt Yair, man. He hit him with a little check right hook as he was stepping in. Switch stances, lands a combination, throws him down like a child, and then just gets a knockout win. The finishing sequence is incredible. The fight itself was dominant. And it's another title defense for the great man from Australia. What do you think about that win for Alexander the Great Wolskanovsky? It was awesome, man. I mean, like you said, the, the that's that has to be one of the best ending sequences in a championship fight, right? <laughs> it's just how he picked him up, slammed him down. Dude, at first I thought he was going to go arm bar of the way he was holding the arm. And I was like, oh, shit, that kind of goes hard. But he just went straight into pounding him, which, I mean, that, that was probably the more intelligent thing to do. But at first he, he kind of had to be going because I was like, no way he's about to do it like this. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Regardless, though, uh, no, I mean, like you said, the combination, and it was just the fact that he got him as he opened up because it all started with Ayuri. Ayuri threw his, he threw his left and his right, then he went kick to body, opening up that whole opposite side. And like you said, Walt capitalized on that, and he got him right there clean because he was, he was just wide open for the taking. Um, I mean, what else can you say about this guy? I mean, he's getting himself in that all time talk, you know what I mean? The way he's looking. And as far as like his actual fighting and fight IQ, he's having like those, Demetrius Johnson kind of looks and, and, and the GSP kind of levels. He's looking like the, the you know, not to sound a little cringy, but the ultimate fighter. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, like, he's really looking like the complete fighter. Yeah. 
And that's awesome. I mean, that's what you want to see out of a champion, a guy who could do it all in an MMA. And obviously there's a – you look at all the guys and they kind of have their, their wheelhouse. You know, you have Islam with, you know, Samba slash wrestling. You got Izzy with kickboxing. You got uh, uh, Aljamain with the wrestling. But you look at, at uh, Vulcan, he's kind of developing into like a complete fighter. He just kind of does it all. Obviously, he might, you know, he's maybe not uh, Charles Oliveira on the ground. He's not, you know, uh, uh, Israel Adesanya in the kickboxing range, but he, he, he does it all and he does it all very well and highly. And it's not, and it's so good that it's not a, it's not like an MMO character where, you know, like, it's going to sound weird. I'm making an MMO character comparison here, but like, you want to be really good at, at things because if you're just okay at everything, you're just going to be okay. You're not going to stand at any department and be able to, you know, do anything great. So, but he's managed to find a way to kind of like, I think it's it's really his IQ more than anything. I mean, he's just such a smart fighter. I mean, you can go back on the show, Josh. It was it was quite some time before I ever like, I'd say gave any sort of respect to Alexander Volkanovski. I think even at the time when he was going into the Alda fight, you can go back and listen to that episode. I just I, I didn't see it. And granted, I don't think the guy of then is the guy of now. I think if Volkanovski now were to fight the Volkanovski of then, the Volkanovski now would beat up the Volkanovski who bought Jose, who fought Jose Alda. I mean, I think it's a significantly better fighter, a significantly more intelligent fighter, and he just he just knows how to do everything he wants to do and comfortably, and he's just doing it. He doesn't it doesn't take a lot. There's not delayed reaction. It's it's just natural to him, and I think that's what's making him so such a special uh, athlete. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. And he really is. I mean, he, we kind of laughed about it, but he is the ultimate fighter. There's not a single aspect in which you're going to step into the, the cage with Alexander Volkanovsky and, and be better than him at, be better than him at that one particular aspect. Like, even a guy like Islam Makachev, who was like, I mean, I, I hate to go back to that fight, but that fight is still so impressive to me. I mean, he was facing the champion, a guy who had literally, I mean, the only guy to ever even compete with Islam in the grappling with Arma, was Armand Saruki, the only other guy to compete. And even Armand did not win those exchanges. Granted, he was younger, short notice, that sort of thing. Volkanovski came up from a weight class, was able to compete with him, win exchanges. I don't see how anybody at Featherweight's going to do that, you know what I mean? But I also know that nobody at Featherweight's going to be able to beat him on the feet either. I also know that nobody at Featherweight's going to be able to out heart. Alexander Volkanovsky. I know nobody uh, at Featherweight has a better fight IQ than Alexander Volkanovsky. I mean, it, just as a, like an example, I mean, you went in and said that um, we kind of didn't really give him his, his just due until probably longer in, in his title reign than it probably should have taken. Um, and I think part of that was that rematch with Max Holloway, and we're big Max Holloway guys, where I think that Volkanovski lost that fight. But even then, in that fight, I mean, you, you saw kind of what was going to come to be where Volkanovski got straight up dominated the first two rounds, got dropped, you know, in both rounds, and then he was able to use his fight IQ, calm down, get himself back into the fight, and eventually retain the title, you know? I mean, that's – there's there's not a single aspect of MMA that you're going to dominate or be able to um, be better than Alexander Volkanovski at for a long stretch of time. Yair had moments. I mean, you got to give him credit. Yair gave it his all, dude. I mean, he, yeah, yeah. he went in there. He did not go in there trying to survive. You know what I mean? He did not go in there trying to just, you know, make it to a decision. He went in there trying to go in there and try and knock out the, the featherweight champion of the world and try and, you know, stamp his claim as being the best 145-pound fighter on the planet. Didn't work out for him, but it was still a very entertaining fight. In regards to what is next, Alexander Volkanovski did come out and say afterwards that he does need surgery – which, due to the timetable, it is expected to potentially keep him out of a potential rematch with Islam Makachev later this year. That being said, he also had a face-off with Ilya Taporia afterwards. He's also said that he'd be willing to fight Aljamain Sterling, who said he's interested in coming over to featherweight. If you had to guess, what do you think's next for Alexander Volkanovski at this stage? Ah, God. I mean, there, like, there's a myriad of options for him, man. Uh, it just kind of depends on the time his timetable to recovery goes where the UFC wants to do the events at if you want I'm assuming they want these fights on a pay-per-view which is another thing uh they're all great options I mean if, if Aljamain comes up after if he does beat Sean you know obviously that's an option there Ilya is always an option yeah I mean he he kind of I feel like he's kind of more leaning this way a little bit just because I think he went he went on the Hawani show right and he said you know he's like don't fight Max let me be the one to beat you which kind of makes me think like he's giving a lot of Max respect there because he can see Max beating Ilya you know Mm-hmm. So that was that was something a little 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 tiny thing I noticed there. 
Uh, by the way, Max Daly is like a matchup that I'd be so down for that I kind of want to happen. I don't, I'm not going to lie to you. Actually, I'll be selfish. I want it to happen. I'll be honest. But, uh, <laughs> 155 Islam is one day I think we have to see again, no matter what, man. Like, you, we kind of got, there was just too much there. There was a little, there's, there's something there. There's some substance there, you know? Like, we need to run that back one more time. Uh, I, I think we, that, that book is in, uh, that chapter isn't closed on that book yet. Uh, and I think uh, to talk a little bit about Yair a little bit here, I kind of want to double back to him. Yeah, he ended up getting the the the, the win, but uh, I think he showed some good moments. He had a little, you know, a little uh, highlights here and there. And I think even in both game props afterward, he said, you know, I you really you really made me prepare for this one, man. Like you know, and it's not like he doesn't prepare a lot for all his other fights, but he said he really had to like dial in on this one and uh, and lock in on it. And I thought he was looking good at the start of the third. He kind of opened up, sadly, a little moment, momentum slow down with the headbutt, man. Uh, I don't think it played that much of a factor going forward. Like, I don't think that would have been, that was the end all be all, but it kind of does suck because it, it does make you wonder a little bit what, what could have been if it didn't happen. But regardless, the Volker was coming forward at that point. So maybe it still would have been the same outcome. Uh, regardless, so I do think though, Josh, we have, we have another matchup on 145. Arnold Allen, yeah, your Rodriguez is the easiest match to make right now, right? Yeah, you're probably right. Yeah, that's actually not a bad fight to make. Um, I'd be totally down for that one. Are Although you, I will admit, I had not you, thought of it, so maybe it's not as... <laughs> are, you, are you DTF, Josh? Dude, I, you know me. I'm always DTF. I'm always DTF to see these fights, man. What are you What are you talking about, man? <laughs> um, yeah, I think that... Uh, yeah, I, I agree with most of what you said. I think Arnold Allen for Yair Rodriguez, that's a pretty good fight. I didn't think about that one off the top of my head, but... You know, if you take a look at the rest of the division, there's not really many other people for him left. So, I mean, most of the guys at Featherweight are actually tied up. I mean, Tafori is not, but Holloway's going to be fighting the Korean Zombie, you know what I mean? Like, Brian Ortega is out right now due to injury. So, there's been uh, – there's not many guys left for him to fight. So, we'll see what happens. But, dude, I think we should go ahead and move on to co-main event because the co-main event UC 290, I fucking told people. I fucking told people for a long time. I'm like – Alexander Pantoj, if you pay attention, this guy is so violent, he's so entertaining, and he's going to be the next flyweight champion. He ended up doing so, although uh, it, Brandon Moreno, the assassin baby, putting in a hell of an effort. The fight of the year. I don't think anybody's going to dethrone these two. I, I, it'd be very, very tough to do so. In the end, it ends up being the cannibal who gets the nod by split decision. Afterwards, he gets on the mic, and for a guy who's normally so stoic and normally so violent, he gave an emotional post-fight speech. It was an incredible moment. What do you think about Pantoja pulling off the upset and going 3-0 and in the series with Brandon Moreno? It was a banger of a fight, man. One of the best fights I've seen. I mean, it's up there, you know, as far as fights that I've, I've had the pleasure of actually getting to watch. Obviously, I wasn't there in person, but, you know, live on TV. Uh, it, it, it's up there for all time. Uh, I don't know where I would rank it, but uh, it, it was so good. Uh, and as far as like the the uh, the whole uh, afterwards and all that super emotional you know beautiful moment and and all the stuff that came out afterwards about him still driving being an Uber Eats driver like not even that long ago crazy man to even think but the, but we're we're not here to talk about fighter pay we do that all the time mm-hmm. uh, regardless that won't be an issue now I think he'll be I don't think we'll be going back to Uber Eats for a while <laughs> uh, fuck dude Brandon gave it to him man look this and also this this just goes to show man by the way that one score card for Brandon was terrible I do th- I do think there is a world where you can score the fight for Brandon but not the way that judge did uh, and also this goes to show like a scorecard can be wide because you know you can score it for one Pantoja and I don't disagree with you and the fight can be hella fucking close you know this, I think this is actually a perfect example of that Josh uh, because if you look at the stats I think Brandon outlanded him in al- almost every round he outlanded him in total strikes as a whole uh and uh, I also saw, like, a very compelling argument. I, I saw on Twitter someone gave up actually a very compelling argument for Brandon 3-2, which is actually very – I thought that was actually very good the way they broke it down. They made a lot of points. They showed a lot of rules. Shout out to Lamo on Twitter. Uh, he was actually one of the more uh, respectable people who have actually, like, actually constructed something well on Twitter. I just wanted to give him a quick shout out because I, I like the way he constructed it and showed actual UFC rules, showed actual moments and fights, highlighted them with videos and stuff. So – I don't know if he makes any sort of content, but I just wanted to put that out there if anybody was interested in it. Uh, and I thought it was interesting, too, because I, I was listening to Big John this morning. He also said he had a 3-2 Brandon. So, you know, and he also said he didn't have an issue with Pantera winning the fight. So I just wanted to put that out there. By the way, I mean, these guys, these guys are close in competition now, man. Like, and th- this whole weight class is, is just tight-knit. 
there's you know they've all fought each other at least once maybe even twice at this point uh some of them going on four or three you know yeah uh you know i i, I was telling josh before in the in, in the green room i'm like dude 125 is a clusterfuck you know i feel like uh no matter what like at some point in time like no matter what, I don't think they're going to do this. I didn't think they would run Brandon Pantoja back instantly because it, it doesn't make sense to do it this quick. And plus that those guys, I think, I think Pantoja should take the rest of the year off regardless. It's because I was, you know, I think that's the first war he's ever had in a while. And, you know, take the moment in, embellish it. You know, you had to wait so long for it. Why not enjoy it, you know? That's the other thing. Enjoy champ life while you have it because it's not going to last forever either. You know, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, you know, kind of a uh, uh, we were talking about how Brandon Raval was actually supposed to go in the cage, and uh, well, the fight before Drikus beat Robert Whitaker, which we'll get into that later. Izzy went into the cage. We'll also talk about that later. And Raval said, you know, he was supposed to go into the cage to face off with the winner of that fight, but he said once Izzy went in there, he said he knew he wasn't going to get into the cage after that. So <laughs> it looks like we're probably going to get Brandon Royal Ball potentially in the next fight. But at the same time, the fight was such a banger that UFC might run it back. Regardless, though, I feel like Brandon should take some time, man. I mean, he's been in so many wars. I feel like he also could get the Colby Covington treatment and get this fight regardless if Pantoja does have one in between, which there's nothing wrong with. And Brandon's so young, too. He's he's 29. He's going on 30 here soon. I mean, he he's fine. You know, he can take some time here, and he's made some pretty good money. I think it'd be a pretty intelligent move to go forward. In my opinion, I do personally think I'd love to see them run back Roy Val- or I'd love to see him run Roy Val Bozzi as the next matchup. Winner gets that fight, gives Pantoja some extra little time to recover. We get another top ranked flyweight matchup in there. On top of that, we get some other contenders in the flight division, flyweight division rolling and kind of coming up. Obviously, we got Mohamed Makayev there, Manel Cape, Steve Ursik, who's a new guy in the picture, new guy on the block from Australia. So, I, I would just really like some, some time to be drawn out in division as well, so we can kind of get another guy coming up on the way. Because if not, we're kind of going to get stuck here with some of the older guys, at least personally, in my opinion. And uh, I think it'd be for one. I think it'd be great for Abazi because he gets his his night solidified win over a, a ranked guy, and uh, obviously after having the controversial win over over Kai Car. And for Brandon, I mean, he's not that far removed from the uh, from the Pantoja loss. I know it was in 2021. Josh already gave me the oh, shit about it, guys. I know, but I, I really don't. I just it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But it's but you know, I, it will be a bigger fight no matter what. All yeah. these fights are great. I think that is one thing, thing uh, personally that I want to make clear. I'm not going to have any issue with any of the fights. I don't think – if they give the fight to fucking Abazi, Kaikara, which I mean I don't, I don't think they'll give it to Kaikara, but uh, Revol, they're all great fights. I'm not going to be mad if they give it to anybody. I think that it'll all be fun regardless, and all those guys are going to get their sh- their shot eventually. So I mean, I, it's just kind of my outlook, in my opinion, on, on kind of the direction I'd like to see them go. Yeah. You know, it, admittedly, um, here's my issue with that, and, and I'll also – I'll say this straight up front. I'll put my cards out on the table. Just offer my opinion straight up front. I am going to go fucking insane if I have to watch another Brandon Moreno get they've get another title shot. I'm sorry. See, I just I, I don't think they'll run it back though. Just I no 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 I know. No, but Dana, fight, Dana already fight said again. like you know Dana already think, said yeah. Dana didn't rule it out too. Yeah, he and didn't I know rule how it out. Much, I don't think you're, but, but Josh, I don't think it's so much as like the next fight as far as like like I think those guys are very likely to fight again no matter what. Like Brandon is not going to have a fight in between. Yeah, no, I don't dispute that. I don't dispute that. It's more, I'm just saying that I, I, I don't, I don't want to see them fight immediately. I just, I can't. I, I like Brandon Moreno much as much as the next guy. You know what I mean? But it's been three years. By the way, you're the only guy I've seen with this opinion. By the way, I, I've, I've been on Twitter a lot, and uh, like I tell yeah. you, I'm in the card community, and no one has an issue with them running that fight back. No, of course not, because I mean it. It's just everybody Everybody loves Brandon Moreno. I understand why, but I'm saying if there were – I've never seen a fighter. Like, if he gets if he gets this title shot, it'd be fucking insane to me. You know what I mean? <laughs> he's already had. He's already got it. I mean – It's crazy, though, but but if you're being honest, this is one of the – like, the only weight class where they can really get away with this. Well, like I said – I, I know, I know. Like, like I said, they got 170. Colby Covington, man. That, that's another – that's another – but you know oh, something? Oh, well, they're we not can. getting away with that, though. People are pissed. That's what I'm saying. They're not yeah. getting away with it. Oh, okay. I see. Yeah, they can get away with their flyweight because I mean, I fucking I, I, I'm the only person who gave a fuck that Alexander Pantoja had to wait like a year and a half to get a title shot to begin with. I like. I mean, this this fight just, should have happened when it was. A they didn't even. Hit, they so. didn't even fucking. They, most people don't even know these motherfuckers already fought like twice. You know what I mean? Like, dude, did you do you ever go and read some comments and they they have no idea that they had already fought or? Oh yeah. Read Not only shit, that, but they they had already fought twice. I mean, they usually put the they put the two on the post and said it's a rematch. 
if you don't want to count the, count the tough fight, they sometimes count and sometimes don't for whatever reason. I don't – whatever. I don't know I don't know why they don't count the tough fights as actual fights on the record, dude. I, that's the weird thing. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. It makes no sense. I wonder if they count it if it goes to a third round. Um, I don't know. I don't think, I think that's a good. That Maybe it actually, but I don't know. I'm I'm dumb, so don't listen to me. But uh, yeah, I mean, for full disclosure, I guess I should say how I what I thought about the fight. I gave uh, I gave Alexander Pantoja, I gave him round one, three, four, and five. I think four. You can definitely make a good case for Brandon Moreno, and afterwards, I was still like, I don't know, you know. I'm pr- still pretty iffy on that one. I haven't gone back and rewatched the fight. Uh, I just haven't had time. But admittedly, uh, yeah, I thought Alexander Pantoja uh, won. 4-1 on the night of. I definitely could see a case for 3-2. I don't think I could see a case for Brandon Moreno winning. Um, just personally. Because I understand the argument. I understand the damage versus grappling argument. Uh, but also in some of those later rounds, like round 5, he really didn't land much to begin with. There wasn't much damage from Brandon Moreno. Because I was in Pantoja was on, like, you know, white on rice to begin with. So, um, yeah, I mean... In in regards to Angel, you just sent me something. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just it was just a one the guy the thing I had mentioned earlier with Lamo. Word. All right, all right. And yeah, no, check it out later. Okay. Yeah, I oh yeah, I saw this post. I didn't agree. Hey, but I thought he for once though, like you know when someone just says like I disagree and they just lay out their scorecard. I thought there was actually one of the more educated people who actually kind of try to make an actual compelling argument with actual facts and kind of stuff to back it up. And actual good points where we usually get people who are just like, just on the opposite with those yeah, sort just of say like, like robbery and they don't have even, any. Not, not even that, but they just don't try to build a case for it or like they dispute your opinion in any sort of like, in a compelling way, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. explain. Like, sometimes that's all I need. Like, I don't, there's no issue with disagreeing. There's nothing with disagreeing. You know what I mean? Like, that's what other people. I don't know. No, no, no. I don't. I don't. I don't have a problem with disagreeing with people. Like I said, I don't. I don't hate Brandon Moreno. I'm actually. I'm, I like like, like Brandon Moreno. It's just I don't think he won that fight, and I don't. I don't think. I think it'd be insane if they gave him uh, an instant rematch. Um, but I don't have any ill will towards anybody that thought Brandon Moreno won. Let me be clear. Like rounds, you know, two. I I could see you giving him. I mean, I gave him two. Four was pretty close. I guess you could hypothetically give him three. You know. But I I wouldn't give him three or four. But you get you get what I'm saying. I understand I understand the argument. Um, in regards to this fight, though, um, I thought Pantoja deserved the nod. I personally, in regards to what's going to happen next, I think that I think it should be Brandon Roy Val. I'm going to be honest with you. I, I I get the Amir Albazi argument. And I get your argument about the, having a potential title eliminator fight. At the same time, though, um, I think it also just depends on timelines. I think if Alexander Pantoja feels good enough to go by, like, October, not October, that's that's too soon, by, like, November or December, then I don't think you should book that fight. I think you should just give Brandon Roy Gall the title shot. Um, I understand it'd be a rematch, but, like, what are what else are you going to do? You, you mean you, you can just make poor Pantoja sit around? Because Pantoja, like I said, most people don't know this, but he already had to wait around for, like, a year and a half to get a title shot to begin with. You know what I mean? So... I don't know if he'll want to say. By the way, the top of that division is so fucked right now. Like, <laughs> I'd say the only guy who's in a shitty spot to like get himself in the title shot is like a mirror Ballsy dude. But like, if you look at it, Nicolau coming off the Revel loss, Kai Carl coming off the Brandon loss, uh, Perez. He, it's been a while since he fought, right? Uh, I think Alex Perez just lost to somebody. I can't remember who it is though. Yeah, really, that wasn't that long ago. But that meant no cape. Did he lose a bit of cape? I feel like doesn't. That might be. Incredible. Oh, never mind. Never mind. He was scheduled multiple times. He was supposed to fight Manel Cape in March. Uh, Pantoja, Pantoja last defeated him in July. That's yeah. That's who I thought. Yeah. See what I mean? Like <laughs> this division is a shitty spot. And like I said, you got to go all the way back to eight and nine. You got Matt Schnell, Manel Cape, Tim Elliott, Muhammad Makai right there, and then Sumata Jiri, who was probably taking some time off at twelve. So mm-hmm. yeah. Quick, yeah. quick, quick! Last in a tough spot, man. That's what I'm saying. I feel like they really need to like draw stuff out and let some of these guys like weed each other out. Yeah, I mean, here's the thing though, is that also, dude, is like, you're not enti- you're not wrong. Like, the division is fucked. Most of those guys have already fought each other. Like, they've already. But the reason why that's already happened is because we we spent three years letting two dudes just fight each other every six months. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, that whenever whenever you just spend like three years of just letting guys fight each other over and over and over again, like, 
like Rip I said, we, we did we did have that unfortunate look of this Zap Pantoja Moreno fight not happening when it was originally scheduled. You know, I feel like yeah. we would have been in a pretty comfortable spot if that fight had happened then. But now, hopefully, we can get back to normal. Hopefully, but I don't know. About, I, flyweight, I don't have any optimism for because UC doesn't give a fuck, so they'll probably go for like whatever the easiest like decision is that can like. Because they don't really care about any of these guys, they're just gonna do whatever the easiest and potential the most profitable they're, one is. They're gonna they're gonna cuck us and they're gonna fucking give them. They're gonna they're gonna skip Raval. They're like, yeah, dude, you thought you're gonna go into the kitchen? Yeah, we're going to Bozzi, dude. <laughs> I know. I think I I don't even think it's all. I don't even think Albazi is a part of it. I think it's I think it's Roy Val and Moreno. That's it. I think that's the I think that's the conversation. You know, are you you're excited for your Roy Val Brandon Moreno rematch up, dude? Title limit. <laughs> Dude, please stop. <laughs> you know, you know, dude, and they, and once again, they fought before! But you know, you know, Josh, there's a storyline, though, of R- got hurt in that one. And then Moreno, you know, he took his opportunity to fight for the title, cause then Moreno fought for the title. Yeah. And he went to a draw! And that was like, dude, crazy how the timeline would be different. Right? Yeah, I mean, I, we, I, I think about that sometimes. We've talked about it on the show before, but like, Brandon Roy Val was like a, a, a freak broken arm away from potentially just fucking up the whole timeline of the UFC, you know what I mean? Because that fight was competitive, too, in that first round before he got hurt. So, um, yeah, big what if there. But nonetheless, I think it's about time to move on because middleweights. Middleweights, man. Uh, Holy shit. Yeah, this is this is this is MMA at its finest, my man. Um, Drikus Duplessis, huge underdog. Nobody's giving him a shot. He goes in there and he stuns the Reaper, Robert Whitaker. Gets him out of there in the second round. First round was competitive, but in the final seconds, Drake has got a takedown, kind of flipped the script on him. And then in that second round, he came out, dropped him with a short right hook, and uh, then had a face off and conversation with Israel Adesonia, which, you know, I don't. <laughs> It's very controversial, but what do you think about the fight itself before we go and get a break into the potential Izzy fight? Bro, talk about, like, one of the most shocking moments in my time of watching. It's it's, it's up there, you know? Uh, and, look, I am, like, one of the few that I, like, I had known about Drikas before, probably a few years back, because he had fought Roberto Solidich, and I was really interested in Roberto Solidich as a prospect potentially coming into UC at some point. I ended up going to one, has had his struggles there. Regardless, though... They fought twice, and I remember one of the big things was uh, for going into that fight. Roberto said that in, he made the mistake in the first fight of like uh, he was having some diet, like he's, he really was in it, like eating properly. He and also he came a little he came a little bigger for that weight so fight because he he had heard that Drikus was really 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 physically strong, cut a lot of weight, so he was like he wanted to match that as well. And he said it kind of ended up kind of uh, backfiring, and then when he came into the next fight, he kind of. Dialed in on his diet, dined in on his food, came in at a comfortable weight, and it, you know he ended up getting the the, the nod that time around. So that's kind of how when I I had first seen Drikas, and I knew of his talents. I mean, I knew what he could possibly do, man. He's very you know uh, gifted as far as his physical ability, and look, he does a lot of things just like just through. He's just one of those brute force, you know. He has a lot of power. He comes forward, and uh, you saw his gas tank might have actually helped. So, new mythical fighter on like 100% oxygen intake, Drikas to plus C. New mythical fighter has been on lockdown. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. He said he felt great afterwards, and dude, uh, uh, I saw that they were talking to him in the media room, and he talked about kind of uh, how his coaches like prepared really well for this fight. They like uh, I don't know if you noticed, but like he came out southpaw for this one. He was switching stances, but apparently the coaches said they had seen him footage that like. Robert had been tagged or like times he had been hurt in fights were from a southpaw stance or when punches were thrown from a south, you know, from a southpaw. Mm-hmm. Um, another thing was he, he he fought with a very high guard because, uh, you know, if you go look at the UC numbers, you know, they, they keep track of data where like majority of punches land. Robert throws like 80 percent to the head and like th- like a 13 to the legs and the rest of the body. And he, you know, stuff like that. And it's like, wow, they really, and you, and you go back and watch the fight and he did all those things. You're kind of like, shit. All right. First of all, shout out to the team. Shout out to Drigas for sticking to the game plan, right? Cause it ended up working mm-hmm. out and fighting with some pressure. Fuck, dude. I mean, and, and I, I think I even said it in, in the green, uh, when we talked about this fight, uh, the first time I read preview, I'm like, look, he's heavy on top. He does have some submissions. He could do some stuff there. And we saw some of that. We got some glimpses at it. Look, this matchup against Israel, all of a sudden, just got a lot more interesting. There's always some heat behind it. Fuck, man. I, I mean, what do you have to say, Josh? It's sad for Robert Whitaker, but I will say 
it's sad, but I'm like, realistically, this is probably one of the best things that could happen in this division right now. Yeah, as a Bobby Knuckles fan, Saturday night was a really was a really night, really rough night for me. You know, I thought I thought Bobby Knuckles was about to just sleepwalk his way to a. I'm mostly joking. Let me be clear. Like we talked about this like off air, and I, I was like, you know, Drinkage probably wins. You know, eight out of ten, times. not eight times, eight out of ten. Excuse me, Robert probably wins eight out of ten times, but like that twenty percent is still really is a big number. That's one in five. You know what I mean? Um, but I thought I thought going to that fight, Robert would potentially like just easily get there. I didn't think it was even going to be that big of a struggle for him. I thought Drikas could potentially rock him in the first, maybe, because he just comes out so wild, guns blazing, anything could happen. But I thought Robert Whitaker, you know, he has a good enough chin. You know, he's he's very, he's very, he's very light on his feet, always staying moving, has so much heart. But in the end, dude, I was very, very shocked. I was very, very impressed. Always knew it was a possibility, but seeing it happen is a different thing, man. Um, it was a, I was so impressed, and you're right, dude. That uh, everybody we we joke about it, but he said after the fight, he's like going to that second round. I've never felt more fresh, and you saw it too, because I remember I after that first round, I was like, oh, here's where Robert's going to turn it on. Like that first round was was close. You know, Robert had his moments on the feet. Drigas had his moments on the mat. I was like, this now Robert's going to turn it on here. He's going to put in some work. And instead, dude, Drigas stayed calm. He stayed out there. He stayed collected to get the knockout win. Super impressive. But now we have to talk about the drama. We have right. to talk about the drama because everybody's out, talking about it. Everybody's talking about it. Coming out of the UC 290, it was not Volkanovski. It was not, you know, Pantoja. It was Israel Adesanya getting in the ring, going face to face with Drikas Duplessis. And, uh, I mean, I, I can't say it, but he was saying, it's just, I, I, I got you, John. No. <laughs> don't, no, 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 don't do it. Don't do it. It's just, just. <laughs> But uh, yeah, he got he got in there and he he said uh, you, you can said, look it up. He he said he said the n word a couple times, not with not with the hard R, obviously, but the imagine? way that the way I saw people talking online, I mean, you would have thought it was the hard R. You know what I mean? Right. Um, nonetheless, uh, it was a very controversial moment. They were going face to face. Obviously, this was all tied into their back and forth, which they had earlier this year. At UC 285 Media Day, I have the literal quote, uh, just so we can have that before we break into the conversation itself. This all started back at UC 285 before his fight against Darren Till. Drake Duplessis was asked about Israel Adesanya. He said, did those belts ever go to Africa? As far as I know, they came to America and New Zealand. I'm going to take a belt to Africa. I'm the African fighter in the UFC. Myself and Cameron Simon, we breathe African air. We wake up in Africa every day. We train in Africa. We're African born. We're African raised. We African. Uh, we still reside in Africa. We train out of Africa. That's an African champion, and that's who we'll be. Since then, they've been very angry at each other. Um, Angel, you have the floor to to because this is a very this is a very big deal. You know, there's nationalities involved. Yeah, race I'm, involved. I'm I'm very passionate about all these topics, man, about race and, and kind of stuff that kind of gets like this and nationalities. Because I have a very different view, and I try to be very neutral. But and I and and the uh, and like I said, dude, there's a lot of people who are getting offended. But I'm gonna I'm just gonna say this: all these people getting offended on Twitter look a certain kind of way, man. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say who, but feel free to go, you know, take your look on Twitter. And uh, you know, it's I don't know. I think that I think that's the <laughs> were it's they, the wrong. Were they, were they Jan Sixers Angel? Were they hit the? <laughs> that's uh, I've seen all those guys on Twitter. I'm really mad about Izzy saying saying that word. Regardless, man, it's but. just like. And also, if that one moment ruined the card for you, dude, like, I'm sorry, bro. Like, you got other, other, you, there's other things you should be worried about. And I'm kind of scared of the things that definitely do bother you. You know what I mean? <laughs> Re- regardless, though, to kind of get into it, I think uh, a lot of people are trying to say it's about race. It's not so much, I don't think it's so much about race, about nationality. Because you gotta, you gotta think about, uh, as someone who comes from like a, a first, te- technically I'd be a second generation, but I say first generation because my, my mom wasn't, my parents weren't raised in the, in the states, my mom was born in the states, but she she uh, she was raised in Mexico. They kind of get into it a little bit, man. You know, I, I get why Izzy feels a certain type of way, man. Because when you have someone saying, questioning your 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 allegiance, your yourself to your country, and the way you look, and and, and let alone someone who doesn't even look like the most of the people on your continent telling you this, you're gonna feel some fucking type of way about it, man. Because I can relate to this in the sense of like, as being a man, I was born in the U.S., you know. And I'm Mexican. I don't know how many people fucking know that. If you don't know, now you fucking know, right? And 
you know, a lot of if, if you're someone like me who was born in the, in the U.S. Who, who comes to Mexican parents, if you go to Mexico, dude, you're not a lot of people don't they don't look at you as a Mexican because you were born in the U.S. They call you white, which is not at all how I feel. You know, mm-hmm. I, I I feel like I am I am a I'm, I'm a national in the U.S. but I am a, but I am Mexican. I identify as a Mexican. I relate to my Mexican people. I relate to my Mexican roots. You know, I I I, I love the Mexican flag. I love the Mexican people. And for Izzy, man, for someone to come along and say that you're not this African, you got to think about it, dude. You got to think about how proud African people are. Think about you don't have these fucking Russian fighters being like, we're the European champs, you know. You don't have these Brazilian fighters being like, we're the South American champs, you know. You know, you have these guys mm-hmm. like like Kamaru and and, and Izzy and uh, and Ghana who two are Nigerian, one's Cameroon, and saying we're the African champs. They're the only people from a country who probably does stuff like that. You know what I mean? You're never gonna catch the European guys being like, we're the European champs. You don't have like Islam and fucking, and, and Leon being like, yeah, we're, we're the European champs. There's, there's a reason for that. You know, you gotta think about that. So when you have this guy coming out here who is a, who is Drikas, who is, is, who lives in South Africa, and like I said, feel free to do your, we're not gonna talk about the history here of South Africa. You I, I will in a minute, because I, I do think it does have to be said. But it, I mean, it does have to be said. Just, history, it, well, yeah, but I'm not gonna fucking do that. I'm not gonna get into it. I know, I know. Could. Because I'm not your fucking history teacher. You can, you have the internet. You can get on it. You can do, you, you can do as you please. Yeah. You know, and, and like I said, Drinkers lives in South Africa. You can go look at the social status of of, the, of that country and, and the divide and everything and how it is, and the people there. And Drinkers who, who lives particularly in one of the cities where most of the population looks like Drinkers and not like Izzy. So, to have you know Drinkers say what he's saying to Izzy, it's gonna make you feel some fucking type of way and saying that you're not representing your fucking people, man, or 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 or, or kind of like. Looking behind or leaving them behind in some way, it, 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 I, I understand where the where that that fuels that passion and why he he feels the need to defend himself in this such passionate way. Now is this and I'm not I'm not saying the way he's doing it is right. I'm not saying if it's the, the way you want to go about it, but I'm saying is the passion and in in the way he feels and the anger that there is some sort of thing to warrant the way he feels. So and and a lot of people are not going to understand it because they've never been through that. You know, I I personally have felt that like I'm like dude, I don't I don't feel. Like I'm American, but I, when I'm in the U.S., people call me, you know, they see me and I'm Mexican to them, you know, and to have my own people call me white, it feel, it makes you feel some type of way, you know. So, to, and like I said, that he's getting that from someone who doesn't even look like him, who, who's from the same continent. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think you you basically said everything that I uh, was going to say for the most part. Um, I can't add my own personal anecdotes like you can um i it's just, it's just i'll be straight up you know i'm just a fucking white guy you know i don't <laughs> and i feel bad like i told you like, yeah. i've listened to a lot of these podcasts and the guys are kind of like they're kind of on the same boat on you they're like yeah i'm just a regular white dude i'm like yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, well i'm not saying in like a negative way but like i don't like yeah, I'm like, like i'm like six percent cherokee and then i'm basically the rest is like uh russian and, and uh irish so um there you go. I mean, I, I don't really have – I can't relate to it in the same way that you can. However, what I can add is that I know a lot about history. I know a lot about, about how this stuff goes. So, I, so like, look, man, I'm not going to say that um, Drikas Duplessis – but also you got to think about this on the inverse. We're talking about, like, a part time. We're talking about, like, certain issues that have to do with South Africa. and and But he's not responsible for that. He's not. Yeah. But at the same time, we also have to remember Drikas – it's like for those of you that are not aware, like I don't know, I, the American school school system is fucking terrible. So I I know that most people don't know shit about South Africa. South Africa, you know how like America had slavery up until the Civil War. South Africa did not have slavery, but what they did have is they did have apartheid. Apartheid was literal racial classification, putting different people above other people entirely based on race. It's not like the U.S. where like you can argue like oh like. Ronald Reagan sent drugs to black neighborhoods, so the black neighborhoods eventually became poor, and they became hooked on. You know what I mean? Like, South Africa didn't do that. They had straight up, if you're white, you're above these people. They had white people they had who had the highest status. They had Indians. They had colored people, and they had black Africans who were at the very bottom of South Africa's societal class. Apartheid ended in the 90s, dude. Apartheid is a very, very recent thing. And telling, and like saying to like a guy like Izzy, like, you're not African, I stayed here, you left, whenever Izzy 
grew up on a much, much, and for anybody who is black in that region to grow up on a much, much, much worse playing field. So, yeah, he left that area. Like, most black South, a lot of black South Africans that have the ability to leave will leave and immigrate to a different place because they are literally on the bottom rung of society. So telling somebody, like, you're lesser than me and, oh, I'm the African UFC fighter because I stayed and I didn't do this, it's like, what the fuck are you talking about, man? Like, you had different opportunities. You had more than they had. They had to leave to go to a different place to get a fair starting point. You know what I mean? So, um, and then on the Izzy thing, I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not, I like, I, I get both sides of it, but I also think that people that are just trying to paint it like white and black, like he just said, like he was just be the African UC fighter. He's from there. What's the problem? It's like, you know what the problem is? Like, <laughs> like I think anybody that's trying to act like they don't know what the problem is in the situation and they're trying to act like everything's just a one-to-one comparison. Like, oh, yeah, one guy's from Nigeria, but he lives in the U.S. The other one just lives in South Africa. It's like they're very different comparable situations. I wish Dreekus would have never brought this shit up in the first place. Um, yeah, that's kind of unfortunate, man. That's the other thing that people don't think about. It's like you got to also look at the origin. This one, one of these guys started it and, it, and it kind of just went on from there, you know? Yeah, and here's the thing also. I said the literal quote. I read the quote at the top of the conversation. So that way people remember, because I'm seeing Drinkus himself say, like, I never said I'm, I'm the African UC fighter. I never said I'm more African. He never said the words more African. But based off of that statement that I read where he said, like, I'm going to be, I am the African UC fighter. You don't think, you don't, what the fuck do you think that's supposed to mean? You know what I mean? Like, what do you, what do you think that is? What do you think he's trying to say there? You know and like, like I told you, there is, there, there is, there's both sides, right? Like, I, yeah. I've gone in the comment sections of, like, randomly on, on Instagram, and there is people who are, you know, are black South Africans who are like, you know, I support Jerikas, you know, I want someone to, to be, who trains out of Africa to be kind of representing us too, you know, I also get those sides, but, you know, there, there, there is, a, you know, it is kind of sad because there is kind of this divide that shouldn't be there, you know? Yeah. Um, ultimately, I, like I said, I, I feel for Jerikas in a, in a certain way, like, it's not his fault that, like, he, he, you know, he's been in a, in a higher plane of existence, he's had a higher, quality of life living in South Africa. He has not had to leave. He has not had to do these things that other people uh, that lived in that country had to do, you know? Um, Yeah. I mean, I would just, I would just, you can also look up, you know, um, Drikas is his literal family history. So, uh, he's not even, not even just that. Just like I told you, if you go, if you look up the city, he's from everybody (laughs) looks like Drikas in the city. (laughs) <laughs> yeah you know so yeah, that gives you any idea of the kind of like the, the divide well no I'm, I'm referring country. to the fact that I, I I mean you can find it on his Wikipedia page like Jekis Duplessis uh, come from like come, like family comes from France and like um, we're like friendly with like Napoleon Bonaparte for fuck's sake like he has like a lo- his family has like a long history of, of fucking like you know um I'm, I'm trying to, like, for, I have to be very careful with the way I phrase stuff, but, like, you know, they, they, he's never had to struggle, basically. Mm-hmm. So it's like whenever you're whenever you're sitting from that point and you're being like, I'm the South African fighter, I've never had to leave South Africa. It's like, well, motherfucker, technically you're France if you're, if you're French, but if you're going by that same fucking thing. So it's like, if you're telling... Well, Josh, you, Josh, you, this, you know, yeah. to kind of to keep it going a little bit, though, yeah. are you excited to find out who the real African champion is? The real African champion will be crowned. <laughs> I will say, beyond the serious aspect of it, the memes that are coming at us are hilarious. I think <laughs> this 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 is hilarious. I think I think if Drikus really wants to have some fun, he should just. I hated that he went back. I think if you're going to say that you're going to be the African UC fighter, roll with that. <laughs> I wanted him like post. I mean, it, it, it's not like he's not going to be the African UFC fighter if he does or doesn't win the. You know what I mean? Like he still is African, you know? Yeah, no, 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 no. I I agree. I'm just I'm just saying like if he if you say that, you better mean it. I want you out there saying like <laughs> I am the African UFC middleweight champ. I'm the real like just just go to like eleven with it. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> Coke, not Colby Covington eleven, but. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, I mean, I, I'm excited for, for him to fight Izzy. I think Drikus, if it is, you know, 
Yeah, as far as the fight itself, that is a fucking bigger matchup. That is a dangerous matchup for Izzy. We've seen it. Yeah. Yeah, dude. I think that is going to be a very exciting fight, especially given that Drugas actually looks to... If his cardio is actually, like, legit, like, it's just... Yeah, dude, five rounds is about to be interesting, though. But the thing is, though, <laughs> Izzy's not going to be hitting you from Robert Whitaker range either, though. But at the same time, we saw Drugas is willing to walk through fire. That's true. Drikas has has a chin that is just unreal. So, but he's been cracked. He's been cracked multiple times. So it's not that it's uncrackable either. Yeah. But now he has a hundred percent oxygen intake, so it's over. One hundred percent oxygen intake. Yeah. I mean, hey, props. I'm honestly happy for him. You know. <laughs> I mean, beyond the fighting aspect of it, breathing like shit sucks. No. So. Um, Anyways, man, yeah, I mean, I'm excited to see what happens next. Um, I we talked a lot about the 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 you, know, <laughs> you should have, um, but yeah, I think this this situation, you know, it is what it is. We'll see what happens. Excited to see the fight itself, and hopefully the drama stops. I don't want to as much as if I may. I realize it sounds like I'm I'm fully on Izzy's side. I just hope we can stop talking about this because there's a. <laughs> there's yeah. just, as a, as a as a white dude who has like you know doesn't really like talking about this sort of stuff whenever it's like you know my my way of life and living and people get really offended very easily and so I don't like talking about this stuff. Hopefully this stuff bring it up. I hope it ends soon too. You're not wrong, dude. Like I I don't like it because I, I don't, don't like want it. an easy repeat. I don't want it because like I said, like I I thought that scene was kind of funny, like in like a train wreck way. But I really hope that I don't have to fucking see that type of situation well, happen again. Like is he in there? Yeah, I just don't want to put anybody in. People keep saying awkward. I, I, people keep saying I'm comfortable. I feel like I get uncomfortable, but I, I want to say awkward. I want to say awkward rather than uncomfortable because that's that's. I feel like that's how people feel more than I'm. I feel like I'm comfortable just sounds bad. Yeah. I, and I. And look, I'm one, I'm one of those people that is like, uh, you know, like, there's, bro, it's gonna take a lot of shit. It, like, for me, I'm one of those people who's not easily offended. It takes a lot. I know we live in a very soft society. I'm gonna say it. You know, I'm on Sean Strickland with that, dude. We, we kind of need our nuts to get fucking, you know, scared a little bit. You know, we need our nuts to grow a little bit. I am on him with that. Not on everything else he's saying. <laughs> I will, I will You're say that. You're not down that. with the neo-Nazi stuff, Angel? You're not no, down with the whole thing? No, no, no. Well, he's not down with that shit either anymore, though. He's oh, like, you're right. My bad. He said he, he said he dropped it. That's right. My bad. He dropped it a long time ago. Regardless. <laughs> Regardless, though, uh, let's go on to the next fight, man. Another, another Aussie on the card. Well, hey, uh, yeah, another Aussie on the card. After, but uh, Jalen Turner, Dan Hooker, man. Dan Hooker, got to, he bounced back, man. I got to give it to him. He's, he's getting them together. It looked a bit grim there for a while, man. It looked like he was, like, one loss away from, like, never bringing it back or potentially even being cut from the UFC. But you also kind of look at the people he lost, which you're kind of like, in the circumstance, you're kind of like, okay, and that was a banger of a fight, and he took that one on short notice, you know. Um, I mean, his performance was great. Tough, tough motherfucker, dude. Tough son of a bitch. Dylan Turner didn't miss weight for this one, which, you know, we kind of, you know, I'm, I'm sure probably the, the weight cut probably did play a factor in kind of the fight to an extent. Uh, fuck me, dude. Dan Hooker brought it to Jalen Turner. I, I told Josh before we started recording, I'm like, dude, I'm like, Jay, Dan Hooker in RDA ages makes way too much sense. I know RDA is booked against Vincente Luque, but at 155, I'd love to see that matchup. I don't know. I don't think it'll, it'll happen. I, don't, I actually don't even know who they'll give him next. Maybe Fazeev. I don't know. That fight's hard to. All the fights are hard. Uh, but uh, how, do, how do you feel about his performance and kind of going forward? What would you like to see him do? Hmm. I mean, for, for Dan Hooker, um, I mean, real quickly, just my quick thoughts on the win. Um, super impressed after that first round. I mean, dude, Dan Hooker, he's got that fucking dog in him, man. You can't, it doesn't matter. He had two broken bones in his body <laughs> after that first round. It did not matter, Angel. It did not matter. Realistically speaking, you're looking up and down that division. I think a Rafael Dos Anjos fight makes sense. He's ranked one in front of him. RDA said he's not really looking for a title. But RDA is still in that weird spot where he's still ranked inside the top ten. He is a veteran who wants veteran fights. Dan Hooker doesn't want veteran fights. RDA doesn't want to fight for a title. But they're in this weird position to where, like, a fight against each other makes a lot of sense. It would be very beneficial. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, so I'd be interested in potential uh, that, that sort of fight happening. 
I just think there's a couple of other guys that can give him. Obviously, there's a ton of young guys right now, 155, uh, that are coming up the ranks. I think Dan, though. I think Dan has won two in a row. He's kind of come back from the depths. I'd rather see him fight a former champion like RDA than have to make him go through a Grant Dawson. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> yeah. he just fought uh, Jalen Turner, who's another one of these young kind of guys on the rise. I mean, who, who do you want to see Dan Hooker potentially fight next? Like I said, RDA is a big one for me. Um, outside of that, though, like, who else could you, like, maybe maybe Hinato Moicano? That could help Moicano come up in the rankings a little bit. I fucking third... knew you were going to bring up Moicano. What is like, with you? <laughs> I know, right? Matt, Matt Favola, I know Matt Favola is 15, but I think I don't think that's a bad matchup. And no. But I think RDA is, like, a way too good. I know the, the only issue is the, RDA is fighting, like, in a few weeks here against the St. Luke, but RDA is 9, Dan Hooker is 10. It just makes too much sense. I think Fazib is an option, but fuck, man, that's a hard fight. Yeah. But, hey, man, no easy fights hey, when you're a ranked guy, so it is what it is. Yeah. I mean, I'm glad we're we're kind of in agreement there. Outside of the RDA one, admittedly, there's not anything I'm, like, dying to say. Like, like I said, like – There's, like – there's like, like I said, there's there, – there, I'd think i say those are the three good options. RDA, uh, Hinato Moicano, Matt Frivola. I think outside of that, I, I, I really don't want to see him fight. I don't want a Chandler rematch. I don't think Armin should be fighting Dan Hooker because he should be fighting up. Uh, same with Gamera, he should be fighting up. Uh, and, and I think Daryush is going to be fighting, I forgot who, potentially Fazib? I don't know. Regardless, though, there, there is matchups in the works, or I think Dan, or I think uh, Grant's going to fight Daryush potentially. I don't know. They're, they're, they'll make it fucking work, man. That's all I know. Yeah. Yeah, man. Um, they're going to make it work. I'm sure he'll get a big fight. Uh, I think he deserves one, man. I mean, he, to go through that hell on Saturday night, I mean, he got, I mean, he had two broken bones in his body. Got annihilated in the first round. Somehow stayed in it and just pull, pulled it out of the fire, man. That's That was a vintage Dan Hooker win. I, I'll be honest, dude. I didn't know that he still had that in him. I think that he's had some see, he's had some rough years, man. I didn't know that he still had that in him. But God damn, I was so impressed. So uh, hopefully he gets a big one next. Uh, opening up the main card, this, this fight recap will last about, I don't know, 60 seconds. Bo Nickel goes out there and just dominates. <laughs> it's just... He, he lands every single punch he tries on Val Woodburn. It's a first-round knockout win inside of 40 seconds. Dude, uh, nobody can hang with this kid. I mean, what uh, what do you do? Like, what do you do at this point? Do you rebook Treshawn Gore? Do you give him a ranked guy? I mean, this is another fight, yeah, another sub-one-minute win. You know what I heard someone say there? Like, he fought his uh, second contender series fight. in the. You know, this is like his third contender series fight at this point. Or fourth, actually, because I forgot he fought two. He had to fight twice. Which isn't like, yeah. which isn't like the worst thing to say in the world, but I honestly, I don't, dude. The thing is, I just don't think he's like what twenty seven years old, dude. He has a decade left in this sport potentially. Do not in in your and right now, I think you're maximizing his potential by building him up. Obviously, I think Trey Trunk would have been a nice step up from to be picking. I don't think you necessarily go back in that direction. Uh. From what I can tell, I felt like Val Woodburn wasn't the same as Trey Gar- Sean Gore, but had a similar kind of, yeah, I'd say, uh, like, uh, we would take certain skill sets and sort of things, like, uh, you know, very physical guy with power and uh, and tough. I feel like that that's a good way to put him. Like, they were both similar in that aspect, so I don't think – we kind of saw that fight without seeing that fight because, obviously, it's not Trey Sean Gore in there. Um, But I, I, I think as, as far as going forward, I think a Marc-Andre Burial matchup I'd be a fan of. Has a lot of experience, tough. You know, he has been subbed, has been knocked out, but he has, you know, he has miles on him. He has a lot of experience, and I think it'd be it'd be Bo Nichols, most experienced opponent, and he's not ranked. Uh, uh before his loss, I think Gregory Rodriguez could have been an interesting, uh, an interesting shout. Uh, I know Brad Tavares is scheduled against Chris Weidman, but that could have been good. I think Bruno Silva is another good option. Um, mm-hmm. uh, my thing is, he just needs time in there. Maybe potentially, eventually, a Chris Curtis matchup. Yamamov is another interesting guy. Like I think if they are to give him a ranked opponent, Josh, the only two to three people I want to see him fight who are ranked at this time, and I mean right now, are Yamamov, Brunson, Hermanson. Those are the only people I have interest in. Mm-hmm. Down the road, yeah, I could see Cal Borrelio, you know, potentially uh, Marvin Vittori, but, but I think they need to give him guys with some experience. And uh, and like I said, maybe he's just that good that he'll never have to go far in a fight. But I think they 
they shouldn't be sold on it just yet because I think they just need to give him some matches at 185. And like I said, he he has attention. People are interested. In him. They'll come in and watch him fight. He has pull. Why would you want to lose that? He could even fight a guy like Rodolfo Vieira, who's nine and two. He you know jujitsu versus wrestling, Brazilian versus American. You know, there's something there. It's just a. Uh, I just don't think speeding. There's no reason to speed up this process. I completely agree. Um, I'm fully on your side with that one. I I said this whenever they announced Val Woodburn as as the uh, replacement opponent, and I saw some people complaining. They're like, "Why didn't they give him Chris Curtis? Why didn't they give him somebody else?" It's like this kid. Like I understand he is like the elite talent for MMA. Like I can't. For those of you who don't know shit about wrestling, and admittedly, I'm like kind of on that page. I don't know much about wrestling. You know what I mean? Uh, but that being said, I know enough to know that this guy is like the real deal, like an all time, one of the greatest prospects to ever step into MMA. That being said, Aaron Pico was one of the greatest prospects to ever step into MMA as well. And I saw, and now he's finally getting his feet under him in Bellator, but how many years has it taken Angel? Like seven? Like, cause he it's debuted it's so it's early and he yeah, took a lot of damage. Did you, you know, what were you saying? No, no, you're absolutely right. It took a bit. Yeah. Yeah, and it's just, I don't think that rushing him in, because rushing him into it, like, who does it benefit? It doesn't benefit anybody. So I think that they can just go ahead and take their time, you know, let him let him get a, another, you know, Val Woodburn, or get let him get another Trey Sean Gore. I want to see him get two more fights before fighting a ranked guy. Yes, that's think that's pretty you. fair. Yes, yes, yes. I'm on, I, I love that. You know, I'm happy you agree with me, because I didn't know if everybody's on the same boat as me, because... I kind of was on the same boat, but I didn't want to put it out there, Josh. But you actually made me feel very comfortable in my answer now. Because, yeah, I feel the same way. I think you should fight two more unranked guys with, with you know, because, like, what's going to happen when the guy doesn't go down on the first takedown? You know, it's not necessarily that his takedowns won't go through, but is able to at least slow down the takedown. You know what I mean? Slow down things that Bo can do. Because that's eventually going to probably happen. But I think we'd rather see that happen before, his, you know, before he gets into those big fights. Then, you know, you know, like you want to see that now rather than later. I guess it's probably this is the way I'm trying to put it. Yeah, man. Yeah. I mean, I just I think you should let this kid take his time. It doesn't it's not hurting anybody. I mean, he do, you're not. I mean, let's be honest. I think by the time Bo Nickel makes it to the top of 185, I don't think Israel is going to be there anyway. So I don't think yeah. I don't think there's any point in rushing me to an Izzy fight or trying to. Um, yeah, By the I, way, what, what was yeah, your reaction yeah. when he, when he won? Because I'll tell you mine. Like, oh, what, like what, what was, was my re- initial reaction? Oh my god, I was like, "What the fuck is this kid?" Because he like he landed every single shot in it. it almost to the point, I was like, "Oh well, like what the fuck?" Like that like that looked like an unreal knockout to me. It's just like this kid's a wrestler, like dude. No joke. I I I uh, I was in the call. With all the people that I watch with, and I was like, "All the boys, yeah." I kid you not, I, I yelled, "He's him!" I shit you not, I yelled, "He's him!" Like, <laughs> I'll, I'll be completely honest. I, I was like, "Holy shit, he's him!" But like, it really, it really is looking like it at the moment. But granted, like I said, you got to look at the level of competition, and I'm, yeah. I'm just, I'm really excited to see his growth, man. Like, how excited have you ever been to see someone progress? Like, don't get, don't get me wrong, you have your guys. Like, there's guys like Shockbot who was like hot on. And I'm talking like where I'm looking forward to. Like, Bo is one of those guys, but I think it's because he's a complete unknown. You know, like we always have guys that you look at and have interest in. Like for me, my guy, like for a while there was Muhammad Makayev, but he's kind of settled in now, and I kind of know him as a fighter and kind of what he's doing. And I think he's still growing too, and 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 learning as he goes. But Bo is an interesting one because of where he comes from and how he's how he's looked with such little fights. Because that's the big difference between him and a guy like Makayev. Makayev had like thirty amateur fights, fought in the IMMA AF, I believe it is which is like the amateur kind of like global MMA thing they do. And and, and that's where his talent showed, but he was, he's was he been doing MMA this long. Bo Nickel came from NCAA wrestling to MMA and has looked this good four or five, five, you know, five, six fights or whatever it is into his career. Mm-hmm. That's where the interest comes in in a different aspect and is keeping me hooked and is where I think we'll keep the people hooked. And like I said, you don't want to rush a guy who has a ten, like a 10-year career ahead of him. Mm. Yeah, I agree, man. I agree. Um, I just don't see a point rushing him on the same page there. I think – I don't know who he'll fight next, admittedly, but I think that there's, like, there's like a lot of good ones, man. Yeah, there's, 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 a, there's yeah. options. I think that's I think that's the nice thing about Bo right now. There is plenty of options, plenty of fun guys. 
And I think one thing, and I, and I, and I told you this, and I, I still think it's true. If I'm Bo, dude, I stay in shape, and I maybe look like, uh, you know, like take a short notice fight, man. Don't be afraid. Like if they call you up, I mean, we saw this past week how fights fell out. Fuck, dude, if you're a Bo Nickel, why don't you get that call up and, and you know, you get a little bit of time in there, dude. There's nothing wrong with that. Like that's, there, there, there's a path, you know. There, there's a lot to be. There's, there's a lot there, man. I, I'm excited. I'm buzzing, you know. Same, man. Same, man. Very, very excited. Um, and we'll see what he does next, but we do got to go ahead and move on because we got to talk about the retirement of a legend, ruthless Robbie Lawler, in the in the main spot here on the prelims on ABC. I, I you know man, I go into this one. I was admittedly I was like Nico Price is the right guy. Nico Price probably going to give us a war. In the end, Nico Price gets knocked out in 38 seconds. An an MMA legend finally getting to go out on his fucking feet. Like, fuck you, dude. I lost my shit. I was, like, losing my mind in my house, man. I was just like, we finally got one, dude. Because it, it's funny, because I'm, like, I'm like only 22 years old, man. But I've been watching MMA since I've been, like, fucking, like, 11. So, like, I grew up watching Robbie Lawler's career, man. And, and I've seen, like, all my favorite fighters from my childhood just get annihilated. Every single fucking one. Shogun just got knocked out earlier this year in his retirement fight. Frankie Edgar got annihilated. You know what I mean? Like, there's multiple of these guys. Fucking, who, who's somebody else that, that lost? Fedor, obviously. Like, these, all of the, BJ Penn, all of the legends have lost the retirement fights. And Robbie Lawler fucking wins, dude. What do you think, man? I was just in so, I was in, I was just in awe, dude. I was in awe. Yeah, no. I mean, look, this is the best, best possible outcome. Like, for once, a guy went out in kind of the way you would want. Um, obviously, sad for Nico Price. He's also yeah. Think about it, man. There's always another guy on the end of it, and, and we fucking love Nico. And he's one of those guys who's just like, I think at this point we kind of know Nico Price is not going to be chasing titles, but he's one of those guys who will show up and fucking fight. You know. Damn. Uh, right, yeah. I I really love how Joe worded it. And I'm not going to quote it right, but if you can, Josh, you make a clip out of it. He said it perfectly. He's like, on like tonight, you know, a lot of guys don't leave, you know, how they how, how they once were at their peak and at their pinnacle. But tonight, Robbie Lawler showed us ruthless, ruthless Robbie Lawler one last time. Yeah. And I, I love the way Joe worded it, and, and then it, it was beautiful. And you know, we saw Robbie get emotional for once in, in in the octagon, and it was a perfect exit, man. What else do you want? He, and my favorite thing to say, man, after all these guys re- retire is. He leaves no questions unanswered. He does. He does leave no questions unanswered, man. And, um, yeah, I mean, I, admittedly, I don't have too much to add. I do uh, want to go ahead and ask you one last thing. Uh, do you think he'll actually stay retired? He, talk, he talked about it afterwards because it, it's funny. It's funny yeah. you're saying this because I saw the clip this morning. And media, I saw one of the media members that said, hey, did you see Connor Street? Connor said, oh, he's back by December. And he's like, he's like, uh, I don't know. I don't think he, he kind of, it kind of pretty much sounded like no. Yeah, yeah. Well, I also know that Robbie, because he, because Connor called, not called him out, but he he said that on Twitter, and then he was like, "Why does he want to fight?" <laughs> yeah, I mean, could you blame him like, though? Could you blame him if, if he could get that one? I mean, that's <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I was like, no, I don't blame him at all. I'm like, you get that money, Robbie. You know? <laughs> yeah, like I completely understand if he wants to come back for one more. Yeah, but, but uh, yeah. yeah, no. I mean, I th- I think it's done. He's happy. He he's uh, I know he's taken uh, Logan Storley kind of uh, under his wing and done a lot of mentoring for him. And he was on his corner that night, I believe. And uh, yeah, no, he he's done. And and that's very it's a beautiful thing to see, man. Uh, I think he'll be a great coach, a great teacher. I'm super excited to see him and in, still in UFC and in Bellator and, and guys' corners. Uh, I fucking it's an it's an amazing run, man. Uh, what a beautiful fucking career. Uh, he had everything you could want in a career. Fought everywhere that you could fight every major promotion you would want to see him in. Held the title. Had, you know, our, in some people's eyes, one of the greatest fights of all time. I mean, he is, uh, he left, he's, his career is cemented and he's one of those guys that he left on his own terms at his time. And maybe not necessarily up top, but on a high. Mm. Yeah, man. I definitely agree. He's one of the few guys to leave on a high and one of the few guys to ever leave on a win. I mean, it's so rare to see a legend go out of win, so I'm so happy for Rufus Robbie on that one. Um, and then, you, and know, then rest- you just hear the chants in the distance. Robbie, 
Robbie. <laughs> oh yeah, I can't believe he cried, dude. I mean, that, that was like uh, they, he cried, and I was like, oh damn, he has to retire now. I mean, like, it's just, did, did you Robbie Lawler like, never shows emotion, emotion, man. Like, <laughs> did you can you blame the guy though, dude? Like, who who? I mean, fucking Jose. No, 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 I would have I would, I sobbed. I, I would have cried cried way more than Robbie Lawler did. I'm just saying, like. Oh shit! He actually has emotions now. Like his career is over. Like he's just, like, I, like he was I, stoic I, for twenty years. Robbie Lawler did not smile for twenty years. Career ends. <laughs> you know, I hope the podcast goes on for a long time. But if we ever have to retire from it, man, like fuck, dude, don't get me wrong. I think I'll get emotional from retiring just from the pod. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, I hear, point, dude, but it's 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 a big thing to just end. You know, end career. Like ending your career on something. You know, I work with the elderly man, and I always ask them, "Did you like it? Did you love it?" And they're like, and they always tell me. For the most part, yes, because they, they they did their job for like thirty, forty, fifty years, man, and they and then they leave it, and it's just like you know they kind of you know, they're in a retirement home, and that's this is life now, you know, and they and they were a lot of times they were really good at it, man. Especially think about guys who were like cops or firefighters, especially during that time. Like it, it, it's sad to leave your career, dude. <laughs> it, mm-hmm. Just to put it simply, for sure, man, for sure, man. But you know, in regards to the rest of the card, it was a banger. I mean, a couple of quick highlights. I want to personally shout out. Tatsu Tara, who I highlighted a couple of weeks ago, had his fight canceled. Had it moved to here. Got a big win over Edgar Chavez. Uh, Denise Gomez, dude, upsetting Yasmin Yaraguay. It was a rough night for Mexico, dude. Dude, I know. It didn't start off bad, but kind of to talk about Yasmin. I mean, look, she's young. She'll bounce back. 23 years young. She, she has a lot of hype behind her. Um, I, I, I've been... After her her debut initially and, and before it, I mean, I I knew about her a little bit, but man, people speak very highly of her. This is just a you know a bump in the road. She'll bounce back, and and she, like I said, once again, someone who has a ten plus year career ahead of her, and it's very exciting. And she can only learn from this. And uh, and you got to give credit to these Gomez, man. She she fought the kind of fight she needed to fight against Jasmine. She needed to just go after her and be you know just make it dirty because Jasmine is very technically sound and very. You know she's not going to beat her on a technical level, but if she comes at her the way she did, and and did what she and did what she did on that night, she's going to take Yasmin out, and and she did that. Um, and going one down, Josh, we got to talk about this one, man. This one was fucking heartbreaking because afterwards, and we're talking about Alonzo Mendes and Jimmy Crew, uh, for those who are in like following along on you know Tapology or or mm-hmm. kind of on, on UFC on Google, but fuck, dude, this this one hurt because uh, you could just see afterwards, man. He 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 takes off the gloves. It makes it almost seems like as he retires, he did not retire, guys. I think he came out just yesterday mm-hmm. and said that he's stepping away from the sport until he feels mentally in the right place, which is a very healthy thing to do and the right way to go about it. Because he's what, like twenty nine years old? I mean, he's still very young. Twenty seven. Holy fuck! He was a ranked a ranked two or fiver. Yeah, no. Uh, I, I was happy to see that he said it's not done because he's, a, in my opinion, he's a very likable guy. Had a lot of potential. Still has a lot of potential. Uh, just that uh, Alonzo Metafield's a, a very tough guy, dude. A very tough guy to get out of there. And uh, I felt like he should have got the nod the first time around. This time around, Alonzo Metafield came very prepared and, and, and took care of Jimmy Crew. But that's the fight game, man. That, that's the one thing about it. And especially at Bay, dude, there, there's a lot of times where you like a lot of these guys and they end up fighting each other and you hate a lot of these matchups because you're like, fuck, dude, why does this fight have to happen? I like both these guys so much. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man. I mean, to to talk about Jimmy Crew, fuck, man. This this one sucked. I mean, it is so. I mean, we hey, we were just talking about with Bo Nickel, right? You don't rush guys too soon. Um, Jimmy Crew is twenty seven. He came into the UFC already, Angel, already five years ago. He was twenty two when he signed, dude. He's been in the UFC for five years now, and he got some big wins. He beat Sam Alvey, you know. He beat Paul Craig. You know, he ra- he got four wins in his first five fights, and then they matched one with a couple of big names, and he's just gotten annihilated. He took off the gloves, dude, and he was like, I'm not retiring, but I need some time. Like, I need time away from the sport. And we wish the best for Jimmy Crew, dude. I mean, 0-3-1 and one in his last four, but you got to look at the people he fought, man. I mean, he fought Alonzo Minifield twice, Jamal Hill, and Anthony Smith. Yeah, uh, you know, former title challenger and current champ. Holy fuck, right? Yeah, exactly. And in this Alonzo Menafield fight, I thought he had a good first round, and that and their previous fight was a draw. So it's like he's fighting a guy who's, like, lower ranked, and he's competing with him. He's showing you that he's still, like, a top 15 guy. It's just like, you know, you, you, he zigged when he should have zagged. That's the way it goes. So um, we hope the best for Jimmy Crute, and we'll see what happens. So. Uh, ultimately, rest of the card, I mean, there were a couple of other big wins. I mean, Cameron Simon, who is, uh, you know, 
I was worried about this fight, dude, because Terry yeah. Mitchell, he he had fought on that uh, Ultimate Fighter season with Kai Kara and all those guys, and he he didn't he didn't get the the call up to the UFC after that mm-hmm. in 2018, and he had a bunch of scheduled fights that got canceled. I don't know if they were outside the UFC or in, I think they were in some smaller promotion, but he he just came back this year in 2023 after being gone since 2018. Two first round finishes, but I'm like, hey, you know, it was two first round finishes, but against two opponents that were four and one, four and two, and uh, you're gonna go fight Cameron Simon, who's looked very fucking good. And let me tell you this, Cameron Simon looked fucking great again, dude. He's a fucking problem at mm-hmm. bantamweight. He's on the come up. Give him some time. He's gonna turn some heads for sure. He's very young. He still has a long way to go, but fuck, man. I, I, I like at, at the time I was like, man, this might, this might be one I want to avoid. But he ended up taking care of business. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he got a big win, and and that was a nice one to see. And I gotta ask though, um, does it like fuck you up at all that like we're getting? Because I'm I'm looking at Cameron Simon's page right now on Wiki, and does it like fuck you up at all that like two fires born past the year 2000 are going to become like really commonplace really soon? Does that also fuck you up at all? Well, dude, there's gonna be a point in time where there's a champ who's the same age as me. So, oh fuck, I didn't even think about that. No, so this dude, is why that, I was just planning see, to die before I got old. I wasn't planning. See, <laughs> see, this, see, the thing is, this is starting for you now. This is starting for me way before in soccer because, you know, a lot of kids, you know, guys get called up in soccer at a young age. So there's been, like, times where I'm like, damn, that guy's 17 and he's on the field right now. <laughs> you know I mean, that guy's 19. And he, dude, the NBA, dude, the people who are our age were already in the already in the NBA making money. You know what I mean? Like, that's, that's another thing you got to think about, dude, like. Uh, we're we're at that point, dude. And I got I don't even know if I feel dude. I got I got called old. I got called an old head like a few like a week or two ago, dude. <laughs> I was playing a game and this this kid who was like, he had been, I think he said he was like seventeen, and yeah. I said something and and I was like, oh shit, we got to get out of here if it's not gonna get Harry. He's like he's like Harry he's like Harry, you're an old head. I'm like he's like how old are you? I'm like I'm I'm twenty two, and I'm like fuck, dude. I'm like I feel like the only th- I feel like old. I'm like I don't feel like it's an old head thing to say, but but I guess I'm an old head. And I was like. The fuck, you're not even you're not even much older than me, bro. bro I'm not I, much older than you. I've never been called an old head, but I'm getting to that age where like I'll like see like somebody typing online, and I'm like, I know this person's like under like probably 16, and I don't know like they're using like terminology that I don't know what that word means, and I'm like, God damn it! I'm fucked. Well, what's, is there something you learned? Is there something you learned? Like what's what's one that you can say? Because there's probably something you can't say. There's not. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there is. No, but I don't have like anything off the top of my head. But, like. It's also like it's like streamers and like other famous people. Oh, I feel I like know. as far as that, I I, can, I feel like I'm decently up to date. Like you know, I I have the Keck W's down. You know, I use that one a fair bit. Well, I you know. so this is an example. I didn't know who Aiden Ross was for like way longer time than it than I it should have taken me. Like I should have probably known who like <laughs> who he is. But then I just like start seeing pop books. But like I don't know who any like fucking people are now. And then like I'll see him like pop up on my feet. I'm like who the fuck is this person? You know what I mean? I didn't, know, I didn't speed. know Speed for a while. I didn't know Speed for a long time. I, I don't know Speed performed at Rolling Loud, you know? Yeah, right? They're letting anybody do it now. Shit. I can mean you, Angel. Cynical prick gonna come back, right? That's an in-joke that nobody... <laughs> you know, when they did the Walmart yodeling kit, that's when you knew it was just like, yeah, they'll, they'll get anyone in there. That's true. Yeah, that's true. Um, nonetheless, though, I mean, we should probably go ahead and keep it rolling, man. I mean, use the 290, closing thoughts, man. Any Anything else you want to talk about? When he was a banger, dude, we had some other highlight performances there. Jesus Aguilar with probably one of the best flight weight finishes ever. Mm-hmm. Uh, Victor Petrino, uh, or Vitor, not Victor, Vitor Petrino at, at 205. Looks very interesting, very physically gifted. Uh, he's definitely someone I keep my eye on at 205. He has a lot of potential. Has a way to go, though, because he just started fighting not too long ago. The center of the broadcast, yeah, he made his professional debut in 2019. Uh had some Ami fights back in 2016, leading up all the way up to 2018. But he's really, really been really active these last few years from 2021 going forward, and is now in the UFC. You know, you know, nine fights in. I mean, well, he came into the Contender Series uh, five fights in, but still, dude, like or six fights in. Uh, so shit. I mean, I definitely has a lot of potential there. But overall, man, great fucking card. I think this will probably be pay per view the year, card of the year, undisputedly. I don't know what's gonna beat it, especially with all the shit that happened that night. I'm excited though because we do have a card that could potentially could knock it off, but and I mean it's gonna happen. And it's this <laughs> Saturday, the UC Apex with the UC. <laughs> Gosh, no, you did not just do that. No, no, I, was, I know what you're talking about UC 291, which is coming. Angel, what day is that? It's like the 29th. It's like the 
literally two weeks from now. Yeah. Like that? Yeah. Yeah, man, we're getting there. We're getting there, bro. We're getting there, man. I'm very excited for I mean, we talked about it before the show started, but, like, there is, like, UC is really coming on strong to close out the year, man. Co- combat this year in general, though. Yeah, I guess not UC. Combat in general, yeah. Uh, nonetheless, though, man, uh, we do have a card, which I just joked about. I'm going to be honest with you guys. I really don't care about this one. Oh, my God, dude, Josh. This is this is a banger of the year, future fight of the year. Holly Holm, Myra Buenos. Come on, Josh. Are you not excited? Come on. Does this just not knock off your socks? Come on, Josh. Josh, this, this potential title implication. I mean, to be honest, Josh, you could have made this a title. It's like... I, I, well, I said Did that, you I said that after Nunez retired, I was like, if somebody, if there's like, if there's like somebody falls out or like Juliana gets hurt or something, I wouldn't be surprised if they just say, fuck it, and just throw a title on the line. I, I'm assuming the winner of this will probably fight for the title. I'm assuming it'll probably be Holly and Juliana, if not like Holly and Raquel. There'll be some, like those three are in the mix, you know, or, yeah, I mean, or Myra, or Myra Buena still like, pulls the upset, you know, you know. Anyway, yeah. well, let's get it, let's break into it. Holly Holm, obviously in the main event, UC Vegas 77. Coming off a win over Giannis Santos in March, it was actually a very impressive one. She dominated that one, taking on the rising Myra Bueno Silva, riding a 3-5 winning streak. Last defeated Lena Landsberg in February. Uh, winner here, like you said, Mike in a title shot. What do you, uh, for first, first thoughts, man, what do you, what's your excitement level? What do you think about this one? Oh, man, Josh, my excitement level, I mean, I don't, I don't want to say it's not existent. I mean, Holly's still a, a person with a, a, a very highly skilled fighter, a lot of, a lot of, still a lot left to give to the to the fight game. Um, for her, man, to see her potentially here in another title fight is awesome, especially at the age she's at. You know, can, still going forward, proving, trucking forward, and and showing us that she she's here, man, and, and she has a skill set for it. My Buena Silva, though, I mean, kind of a I I don't know. This is a matchup I didn't expect. I know they, they, it's something they just kind of kind of threw together. I never. Thought I'd, or at least I never thought in my head, you know, Holly Holm versus Myra Bueno Silva. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know this fight would be something that would ever occur. But I'm, I'm getting it, man, and I, and I'll watch it. Uh, for Holly, dude, look, she is very physically gifted. She's very strong. And at this point in her career, you see how a lot of her fights, she's been controlling them, using her skills, grappling against the cage, clinching a lot. I'm sure she'll do a fair bit of that against Myra Bueno Silva. Uh, I don't think I don't think there's a lot I don't think there's anything that Myra Bueno Silva does significantly better than Holly Holm. Maybe her submission game, but even then, uh, I mean, the last time Holly got finished was back during the Misha Tate fight. I don't think Myra Bueno Silva is going to finish Holly Holm. I think Holly Holm has got this pretty locked into the bag. I don't think there's anything Myra Bueno Silva is going to do in this fight that makes me think that she can beat Holly Holm. I think I'm picking Holly on this one, Josh. What What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, Holly Holm, um, I don't see this fight being very competitive. I like Maya Bueno Silva. Um, I think that she's actually made uh, some massive improvements, actually, since her move up to Bantamweight. Um, that being said, I don't. I think she is not a good enough... I agree with you on, on that point, actually. I agree with you that, actually, on the mat, if she can get it there, she's actually she might be able to have some success. I don't think she's a good enough wrestler to get the fight to the mat. I don't yeah. think on the feet that she's actually going to have much to pose against Holly. Um, I, I think Holly's better in the clinch. I mean, I'll just be straight up, dude. I, I don't think this fight... I don't want to say... It. I mean, this, this is partly why people shit on this card, but it, it's just not very interesting. It's just, this fight, personally, is not very interesting. I think Holly Holmes is going to go out there and play. Well, by the way, how does that put Jack Dolan and Elena at, in the co-main event, right? Like... I, I I hope they move Jack De La Madeline into the co-main. They're, they're I, not going. They're not. They're not. Have they I mean, Have they officially set? Like have they? I don't think they're going to. Are you by any chance? Are you on the website? Can you see what they have here? I, I got to pull that view card. Nope. On the website, Alba Dury of Jong Young Park still there, and they got a and they got a Jack Madeline. I think opening up the main card. I believe. I'm actually gonna be honest with you. I really don't. I really don't care about this. Just because that that means that I can t- tune in. Watch Jack Della Merca guy, and then I can I can tune out, you know. <laughs> come on, come on, Josh. The real banger tonight, though, is Ashley Evans Smith, Ali Perret. Jokes aside, what fight are you most excited? Because I'm not even going to ask you about the co-main. I mean, uh, fucking, uh, let's go Park Jong. That's who I want to take, just for sake of argument. 
Are you taking Albert Durian? I'm taking Albert Durian. I'm getting You're going to take Albert? Yep. Uh, you know... Yeah, I'll probably... I'll, I'll stay with Jun Young Park. I, don't, I, I, got this, I got this in the bag. Maybe. You, you might. I don't know. Well, but we uh, got we, we to gotta talk about a returning heavyweight man who's been gone yeah. for a while. Finally. Yes, yes. I, I thought it was a smart choice. Finally. I think the proper opponent. Juan Harris, man. We, I'm not going to get into it. I really don't like talking about this topic a lot. You know, you can do your own research. But, you know, he came back to sport too soon after going through some tragedy, through a terrible tragedy. And uh, it just wasn't the smart choice. And he talked about it. I think this current fight week, he's talked about, like, yeah, I came back soon. I thought training was the right thing. It was not. And then I was fighting. And uh, I don't know if he had anybody kind of trying to direct him, trying to tell him not to do it. But, look, finally, he took some time away. He's back. He's a good heavyweight. He's fighting uh, Josh Parsons. I think this is a good matchup. He's been two years removed now. I think I think 13 months or uh, I think 20, 24 or 25 months to be exact. Back in the cage. I mean, dude, he was fighting guys like fucking Alistair Overeem, Alexander Volkov, my Saint Tarabara. I mean, those were just not the fights at the time. And there's a guy who who's beating some good opponents like Alexei Olenek and Sergey Spivak. And shit, look at where Sergey Spivak is now in the heavyweight division. If Walt Harris can get it together, man, get some wins here together in heavyweight division that is, in my opinion, heavyweight division is always open because these guys can get some knockouts really quick and fight multiple times in a year. They don't have to fucking cut weight. Uh, I mean, they do got to get a fight shape, but you know what I mean? Like, he, he could get back into the mix real quick, man. I think uh, I think there's definitely some interest here, and, and I'm happy to see Walt again, and hopefully he comes in and he can maybe give a good showing, and, and hopefully him and Josh put on a banger of a fight on Saturday for us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. I mean, I think... Um... I'm very happy that Walt took off the time, Walt Harris. I think two years off, I mean, and he admitted it. He said that he came back too quickly and that he was just trying to work through it. And, you know, just if, a lot of people try to do that. A lot of people try to work through their grief, and it almost never works out. Um, so I'm very happy that he took some time and away from fighting, away from, from his – I mean, this is his job, basically, so I'm glad he took some actual time away from it. Um, you know, man, I think, uh, I hope that he goes out there and get a win, man. I really do. I really hope he goes out there and gets a big win. No offense to Josh. Um, you know, Josh got to stick together. But uh, I you also bastard. think, yeah, I also think that it's clear that they think Walt needs to win bad, which is why they booked this fight. Like, I, if Walt Harris can't win this one, then I'd say, like, he, you know, retire maybe you know what i mean like look at maybe like a different role in inviting like coaching or something else you know what i mean because i don't mean i mean josh, josh parisian got dominated by parker porter you know what i mean like it's just, just, just so i mean i just you know it is what it is um rest of the card though uh it's norma dumont fight week angel let's go 145 never die 145 never die jokes aside Chandler, Chandler, Chandler versus versus Norma Dumont is like a legitimately good fight. No, no, no. You know what's funny? I was about to say the same thing. You're not even wrong, dude. Chelsea Chandler Norma Dumont is actually a great fight. Yeah, like Chelsea Chandler is a dog. Norma Dumont, I mean, the is just you know a savage, is an absolute savage. So I'm at, I'm legitimately excited for that fight. Like I memed on it because I have to because it's women's 145, but like. You know, I am I am pretty excited uh, for that for that fight, man. Um, the rest of the card, I mean, Terrence McKinney is back. Uh, who? Wait, who the fuck is he? Wait, who's he? Who's he fighting? He's fighting. Is this this guy's actual name? Nazim, yeah. All right, he's fighting Nazim. Um, <laughs> uh, also, Ottoman Ottoman Azatar is on the card. Who Angel? I'm not sure if you remember this. Uh, he had that that weird uh, situation. Where is that he, about, like, in Abu Dhabi with the bag? Yeah, what was, yeah. What was in the bag? <laughs> what was in the bag? We still don't know what was in the bag. We do know that he's going to be fighting this Saturday. Um, it was, yeah, it, I mean, rest of the card. It was like a I, sex doll, dude. Could you imagine? I hope so. Uh, <laughs> Tyson Nam is back. I'm a big fan of him. The the oldest flyweight alive. Um, yeah, man. I mean, that's that's kind of what I wanted to highlight. Any, 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 anything you want to talk about? We talked a little bit Jack Jack the Marina earlier. Obviously, we're all excited about his fight. Uh, Tyson Nam is up. He's fighting Azat Maksum, which hard name to pronounce. I think I gave him my best. I know about this kid just because I like love randomly clicking through typology, 
16 no 28 years young flight weight i mean fuck let's see what he can provide man he, he has a lot of experience under his belt he's been i'm um, very clearly been working to the ufc um uh, he's taking on a very experienced tough test and on this week and fuck dude we all you know we always love tyson Nam, man we he's one of those guys who can always get a finish at 125 and uh you know, we, 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 he's one of those guys we just hope sticks around. He's almost 40, dude. He's going to turn 40 this year. I don't know how much longer he's going to be around, but fuck me. I'll enjoy, I'll enjoy him while I have him around. Mm-hmm. And then another guy for me, another fellow, Hanato Valdez, tough guy, will fight to the very end, goes on his shield. I know he's 0-2, but dude, he's, he's, he's tough to get out of there. I think he was, if you remember right, he was the one who got dropped by Matt Frivola like five, six times in their fight, dude. I think he set a new record from, for being oh, okay. dropped the most in a, like a single round or, or or just in general in a fight, it's up there though. I remember that was a big thing. Okay, all right, yeah. I mean, this this card itself, man. I think I'll watch it. It's not the thing I'm most excited for, um, but you know. It, yeah, but I feel like, the, but I feel like there's some. I feel like there's fights that are silent bangers. Like I feel like it'll be a card that will either, will either really disappoint us or really surprise us. There, I think it could yeah. fall in between, but it will be tough for it because of the lack of names. Yeah, I don't necessarily disagree. I don't disagree with you. Um, I think there's there is I, we I shit on a little bit. There is a couple of fights. But Josh, if you disagree with me, I'd fire you from the courtside town off. Oh, that's right. I forgot that you're you're my boss now. Um, <laughs> yeah, <bitch>. anyways, <laughs> uh, we do got a fair bit of news to talk about, man, because. <laughs> I'm not sure which order we should go in with these fight announcements, honestly. Um, let's let's just let's let's just hit off with the biggest one, most recent one. Uh, Tyson Fury, Francis Ngannou, October twenty fifth, excuse me, October twenty eighth, in Saudi Arabia. It's going down. Ten rounds. The MMA lineal heavyweight champion versus. Boxing's lineal heavyweight champion. First time for everything. It's going to be history in the making. Angel. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about this. It's not going to be any experimental rules. It turns out it won't be an exhibition. I know a lot of people were afraid about that. Um, in the end, it's going to be 10 rounds. They're going to go in there, and they're going to box in October. What do you think, man? The, t- the titles are not on the line, right? <laughs> no title is on the line. Well, let's be honest. If Francis won, he mean he would be the fucking champ, wouldn't he? Let's be let's be honest. You know, they might not be on the line, but it's one of those. It's yeah, it's one of those things that if Francis goes out there and win, he he's the heavyweight champ. You know what I mean? Let's, let's be honest, right? Like he he would be the champ, especially with how fucking good Tyson's look. Come on, he, he, we can give him that nod. You know, we can give him that one. Exactly. Yeah. Fuck, dude. I mean, you got to give credit where credit's due. He fucking did it, right? He fucking did it. He got what he wanted. I mean, and look, we were kind of thinking, like, is he going to take a tune-up? I mean, shit, if Tyson Fury is his tune-up, then I, who, who's the big matchup, Usyk? No, just kidding. But, uh, <laughs> no, I mean, to kind of bring it all back in, I mean, shit, dude. He fucking did it, dude. He beat, he, he defied his odds. He did it. He's doing it all on his own terms. He's getting fucking paid. He's, he's, he's I mean, he's getting to do his dream of, of competing in boxing and do it on the biggest stage against one of the best. I mean, one of the best in his in his moment right now. I mean, you literally got the probably the, uh, I mean, arguably the best heavyweight right now you could get. You know, ch- still champ. Let's be honest. He didn't lose the title in the UFC. Still the heavyweight champ, which is the current best heavyweight boxer in the world. And they're gonna do it in Saudi Arabia on the biggest possible stage. Fuck, dude. Fuck, fuck, fuck. I'm probably saying fuck a lot, but it's like, dude, I don't, I can't describe my excitement, dude. I yeah. just. I wanted to be it's in October, right? I just wanted to be October. Yeah. I wanted it to happen. I I, I I might even buy it, dude. Like that's how I said it. But you don't have to go to my Buffalo. I'm not gonna go to my local Buffalo Wild Wings for this one. <laughs> just just for just for the just for the culture, man, and, and to support my boy, you know, Francis too, because I'm sure he'd be getting some pay per view money yeah. too. I, it's it, it's just there's just something so I don't know. I don't know how to describe it. I just, I think it's just excitement. Yeah, man. I mean, I'm look. All that talk about Francis and Gunn fumbled the bag, and even some of like our own subscribers, like I've I've said, like guys, like let's let's be slow on this. Like boxing deals take time. Like like I even you know I, I made fun of people that said that like Francis was afraid of John, like and that he fumbled the bag and this and this and this. It's just like, dude, like he won. You gotta give him credit. There's nothing else to say. Francis and Gandhi won. 
He got out. He got out of his contract, and he's getting what he wanted. Francis Ngannou got one up on Conor McGregor because Conor McGregor stayed in the UFC, and they took half his money from the Floyd fight. They took half of his hundred mil. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> um, Francis is going to get all of that. Dude, how much and, is Francis going to make? That's what I want to know. Well, so it, a lot of people. It, it depends on pay per view. But Saudi Arabia is paying the highest paychecks right now that have been seen in the sport. I mean, they're they are paying insane, insane money. So I'm I'm willing to bet that Francis Ngannou is going to get a massive fucking payday for this. Um, you know, in regards to the fight itself, uh, you know, obviously Big Fran's going to have his cut out before it cut out for him. Um, I would have given him a much better chance that this is going to be a four-round fight or, like, an experimental fight in, like, a cage or, like, mixed rules or something. If it's just a boxing match, uh, it's just ten rounds, like, I don't have much optimism. But, hey, look, I mean... Hey, man, he, he, did, he did the right thing, though. If if you were you either had to go really low and build yourself up or shoot really, really high, I felt like you couldn't really go in between, right? Because... He's, if, if if he fucking goes out there and does it small and he loses, well, okay, he tried. Maybe boxing wasn't. And then, it, you know what I mean? Yeah. But since and he I'm, went really high, I mean, again, you know, he kind of like, okay, well, he shot high and it didn't work out. So I think this is actually one of the best case scenarios for him because if he does win, it's, I mean, it really is just a win-win for him at the end of the day because he can just go back to MMA. Yeah. Yeah, man. I mean, I have to think about Ngannou. It's like he's not really risking anything. He's going to get a massive payday. He got out of the UFC, and he gets to stick it to Dana White and all those people that told him that, like, And think oh, about yeah. it. If he wins, you know, like, you know, that you know, we're kind of all just kind of writing it off, right? Like, I, I get it, but that's, all, that's still a serious possibility. You know, there is a chance. I mean, it's heavyweight. If there's one division where you can get, get away with boxing and I think do something, it's this one, and I mean that's I mean Tyson Fury's you know what is it was it two two it's is it two or three Deontay Wilder fights removed I was fuck I did I forget it's been so long right uh three three Deontay yeah three you know went through three Deontay Wilder fights got dropped in two of those got tagged I mean like you know there there is a world right uh there's always that possibility don't you know don't write our man out I think all as all of us as MMA fans should really be rallying back behind Francis giving him a lot of support because this could be a really big moment in combat sports history. And uh, we're kind of like, oh yeah, he's gonna get paid, and that's kind of all how we're looking at it. I don't, I don't see a lot of people thinking like, looking at the potential of, of looking at the other end of things do go his way, you know? Yeah. Like, what if Francis does knock out Tyson Fury? You know, how does that reality look? Like, that's a possibility. Mm-hmm. Is it a likely one? Not a lot, but still though, like, what are the conversations then? Like, are we looking at Joshua? Are we looking at Deontay? Why? You know, like, what is the future going forward if he ends up coming on on the other side? I mean, obviously, we'll have to talk about that after the fight and with the results. But you know, there's nothing wrong with you know theory crafting a little bit beforehand and kind of living in the moment before yeah, we even yeah, get there. Yeah, I mean, look, man, I'm I'm just I'm just ecstatic. I'm over the fucking moon, Francis Ngannou. I think it's been a long time that like. This is a historic thing, and I think that like we should think about why this moment happened. And we have to give a shout out to the people that have been quietly fucking working behind the scenes. Because, you know, like, look, we talk about fighter pay a lot. And it's understandable. And who do we talk about when it comes to fire? We talk about guys like Jake Paul. We talk about Dana White making this big statement or that big statement. The quiet work with fighter pay and improving stuff behind the scenes is not thanks to Jake Paul. It's not thanks to this. It's not thanks to that. It's thanks to the UFC lawsuit which is currently ongoing, the current UC antitrust lawsuit, which is being brought forward by guys like Nate Ford, being brought forward by guys like Kung Lee, who have gotten it and fighting for the ability for fighters to get what they deserve. And the reason, the only reason why this is happening, again, is because changes have been made thanks to that antitrust lawsuit, including the cap of which, how long they're able to keep people in contracts, and so on and so forth. So shout out to Nate Corey, shout out to Kung Lee. I mean, the, the class, rec, the the representatives of the lawsuit, the name them all: Kung Lee, Nathan Corey, John Fitch, Brandon Vera, and Kyle Kingsbury. Shout out those men, and obviously the lawyers and representatives that they've worked with for helping to uh, improve the sport of mixed martial arts, and also letting Francis and Gunner get a massive payday. So shout out him, man. Um, Dude, what's that undercard gonna look like? That's a, that's another thing I'm curious about. I'm interested to see if they have MMA guys or boxing guys. Right? I mean, that's... I'm interested to see. I mean, shit, with, with Kingpin and uh, 
fucking Misfits and all that and Jake Paul and BKFC, man. I mean, there's a lot of options out there, right? Yeah. There is, yeah. Um, anyways, man, we should go and talk about the next the fight in Austin because, you know, the Ngannou news, Ngannou played it perfectly. Can we, can we agree on that? Because right. on Friday, Friday midday, Ari, <laughs> Hol- Ari Hawani came out with a tweet saying that France Ngannou versus Tyson Fury will be announced very shortly. Naturally, Dana White sees this, and two hours later announced John Jones versus Steve Amiocic. Suddenly, everybody forgot that France Ngannou versus Tyson Fury was even a thing. And then a couple of days later, France actually announced the fight and got all the buzz right. And the UFC had no shots left to fire. But nonetheless, I still can't uh, believe he got him, dude. Like, what the fuck? He actually got him. Like, it didn't seem like it was actually going to happen, but he did. Hey, dude. Hey. And everybody said he fumbled the bag too. Everybody said he fumbled the bag. Everybody said, oh, because you know, one championship said that they were going to sign it. Like anybody gives a fuck what Chachri thought about it. You know what I mean? Like. Anyways, man, I mean, look, I just, I, I just, I'm so happy for him. I'm so happy for him. Hey, you know what? Everybody thought, because Francis was quiet this whole time, that nothing was going to happen. But you know what, Angel? Real G's move in silence, like lasagna. And that's what Francis Ngannou has done over the last few months and gets a big fight. Shout out to him. So happy for him, man. Um, but I did reference it. We got a, we got a massive fight announcement, because... We've been talking about John Jones, Steve Miocic forever. Um, I mean, the, I remember as far back as like 2018, these two were potentially talking about fighting. Um, ultimately, this is the fight they were hoping for in March. Ended up having to be postponed. He ended up, John Jones ended up fighting Cyril Ghosn instead, but the deal is finally done. They will be fighting November in the Mecca, Madison Square Garden. What do you think, man? Banger. I think it's the right fight to make. I feel like these guys should have... I felt like no matter what, John had to fight Stipe, like, at heavyweight. Like, it's something that had to happen. Because, I mean, Stipe's a very established heavyweight. He does a lot of things well. I think stylistically it's a good matchup. I know Stipe is removed from the sport, but look, let's be honest. Like, we really don't know how John really is as a heavyweight fully yet. I mean, like, we didn't get to see him a lot. And, I mean, Stipe's taken breaks before, and he's come back and done his thing, so... I think this matchup makes a lot more sense of what people think. You know, I feel like people are going to try to downplay it because of, like, how long Stipe's been gone and because of recent losses and all that. But, dude, no, like, there's still a lot to see for John. We really haven't seen John as a heavyweight fully, and we might not ever have to because he might just come out here and do this, maybe not exactly the same thing, but a similar thing he did against gone to Stipe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and th- th- we said this at the time back in March, and, and we even got some people who, like, I, I, like, I saw some cops that get shit on us at the time, but, uh, <laughs> like, we basically said back in March, they were like, you know, this is a huge win, but, like, there's still only so much that we saw out of him. You know what I mean? Like, he, you know, took him, took him down and basically sat on him and, and tapped him out inside of two minutes. Like, we, we didn't see anything from John Jones. Like, how will he do in the fifth minute? How will he do in the tenth minute? How will he do in the fifteenth minute? He literally just slits a punch, got a takedown, and Cyril gone gave, gave him up. You know what I mean? Like, he, it basically is. So, I mean, there's still a lot we haven't seen. I still, I think this was the right fight. As big of, as big of a Sergey Pavlovich fan I am, I hope I get to see that fight. For the history of John versus Stipe, I'm pretty excited for it. Um, but yeah, man. I mean, I don't have too many thoughts on this outside of that. We've been waiting for this one for a long time. Excited to see it. And, uh, yeah, hopefully it actually happens. Hopefully. Because I know that it's already been said that these guys have not actually signed the contract. This was one of those things where, like, Dan and he did, like, a fight announcement. So, like, they both vaguely said yes, and he got on, on the, the camera. I hope this is actually happened. So we'll see, though. But uh, anyways, man. Admittedly, I don't think there's a lot to say here. But I think we've been giving weekly updates. So we have to continue doing it. Conor McGregor lost again last night of the Ultimate Fighter. <laughs> They are now 0-7. I hate to laugh, but, like, dude, it's, like, it's getting worse week by week at this point. Because, basically, they went in there, and Jason Knight submitted his boy in, like, 30 seconds. I mean, it was bad, dude. I mean, what do you what do you think, man? Fuck, man. This was a rough one, dude, because it was so quick. And I even joked about it last week. I'm like, dude, do you like it? I didn't show any highlights, because that probably means the fight ended so fucking quick. And, look, <laughs> the f- we came around, and the fight ended, ended quick. Yeah, the fight ended basically instantly dude uh, and the other thing is we talked about this in private and we're like i was like i asked him like has anybody ever like 
gone, like, you know, all their guys have lost. Like, you told me you're like, I'm pretty sure someone has in the past. Well, apparently we found out last night that no, it's actually never happened in Ultimate Fighter history. A team has never fully lost with at least, I'm assuming, one or two people winning. So Conor McGregor might be making history here in a week or so. First sign for everything, baby. You know, like it's just, right? I don't know what to say about it, man. I mean, it is like I mean, you look at the raw. I mean, we said this, we said this a couple times now, but you look at the rosters. I think again, Connor would have not had that much success. I think if the cha- if the teams were flipped, I think if you had fucking Joshua Fabia coaching Michael Chandler's team, it would have been like fifty fifty. You know what I mean? Like, I think there's just such a deep talent difference in the two squads. But that being said, to, to go winless is still a really bad look, and it looks like that's what's going to happen. Um, but yeah, man. I mean, I don't have too much to add to this. It's just, what do you say at this point if you're Connor? It's like. I saw him like the, the after the he he didn't even get that angry this time. He just like saw it and he was like, dude, like are you fucking like are you kidding? He, me? he, he like, already knew, right? He's like, God, he's like, what the fuck am I even like? <laughs> yeah, man, it's rough. It's rough, and um, we'll see. We'll see how things go, man. We'll see. How, we'll see if he gets a win. Um, doesn't look good though. Does not look good. Nonetheless, we have a couple of influencer boxing events going down this weekend. This will go ahead and close out the show. Kingpin, which actually was, like, reported to be on the verge, not even on the verge, was bankrupt. The event was canceled. Apparently, DAZN swooped in last second, saved the card, saved the company, and have the broadcasting rights. So, DAZN now has not only Kingpin on their network, they also have Misfits. These two are having events... This weekend, um, what do you think, Angel? Obviously, Kingpin, they have the semifinals uh, going down, which is obviously King Kenny versus Winters and Nunez. Obviously, uh, Andy and Gibb versus Jarvis. Obviously, our, my, my girl, you know, Barbie is back, you know. Um, very excited for her to come back. Come on, dude. The real female fight of the night is, is uh, was it Julia Polka versus El Brook. Come on, dude. No, I don't care. Um, <laughs> that's the real, yeah, you just don't want to get in trouble, do you? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so we got, we got, uh, I'm not getting in trouble at all, actually. I mean, I, <laughs> I'm not either. I'm dead serious. Uh, but nonetheless, M- Misfits Boxing, they're also having an event going down, um, I believe, actually, never mind, Angel, I could be off. I believe that one is not until next Saturday. I, I'm wrong. They're off by one week. Nonetheless. God, Josh, you fucking, do I need to fucking hit you again? You're lucky I'm not next to you, right? Well, the, the, I, was, I wasn't even bringing stuff to preview the Misfits card. I was bringing it up so we could talk about, like, how Kingpin is, like, the, the kind of complication with the zone there. Because uh, the zone sweeped in last second. They saved the card. I wonder why. What do you I think wonder... about all this drama, dude? Because KSI is, like, literally going at the zone right now. And I mean, what's and... your interest level for this, this weekend's event as well? I thought, dude, first King Ping was a banger. I thought it, I told you. I, I felt like as far as, like, boxing and changing, it was up there. It might have been one of the best. If not yeah. the best as far as influencer boxing. And this week, I mean, shit, they're getting better each week. We saw Winterson Nunes last time out, how he looked. King Kenny's improved a lot. I mean, that is the highlight match of the fucking night. Uh, we'll see bro- potentially both Brooks sisters be facing off potentially. We saw what uh, Julia Polka could do. We saw her skill set. Obviously, she's a, a fitness uh, gal on Instagram and is, and is obviously decided to take the step forward and do this in, in, uh, in the tournament. And do Jarvis and fucking our guy. Uh, Anderson Gibb. I mean, that's a that's a must see right there. You know, we we got some big matchup. We got some heat, and now, I mean, shit. There's, you know, these it's, it's the crossover. I mean, this these guys can also cross over now to uh, soon to uh, to uh, Misfit. Mm-hmm. I feel like it's also open for the door for those people. I mean, I feel like the 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 uh, I think this was a smart decision by the zone. I think this was intelligent. I think this saw the kind of attention that Winterson Nunes and and uh, and, and, and Julie Polka brought in, and, and generally those people on that card. Like I said, dude, uh, you know, us Americans and, and maybe some Europeans don't know who Winners and New, but this guy has like 60 million followers on Instagram, dude. Like he's a big time celebrity in Brazil, and I'm guessing just a, and including, you know, Portuguese fans. I mean, shit, there's a picture on his Instagram with Charles Oliveira, you know? Like mm-hmm. this guy has some pool. I, I I think he's been like uh, someone on the broadcast. He's compared him to like he's like their Kevin Hart. You know, he's like this com this comedy. Like that's his whole thing. But shit, he's got some. We saw that he has some fucking hands just a few months back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man. I mean, you 
pretty did a pretty good job of highlighting most of the fights on there. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of storylines going in this one, man. And uh, I know that KSI and the whole the zone situation with Kingpin obviously nearly going bankrupt, and that was a whole thing, man. Um, I'm intrigued to see if they do cross over um, from like promotion to promotion. If that does end up being the case, that could actually be the best thing for for influencer boxing. Um, but yeah, man. I mean, ultimately, I'm pretty excited for this weekend's card. I think there's a lot of interesting fights. I think that at this stage, you know, I don't know what the fuck Misfits is doing. I hate all pretty much most of the recent. I don't know if you're in agreement with this, but like the tag team, I was fine with like a tag team boxing match, maybe like on an undercard. Now they're having like two in event, like including like the main event being like a fucking. I just I just can't get down with that. Yeah, they took they took they took a little step back. I feel like they they needed to take a little step forward. And I think he's been coming in with the tournament is kind of going right back in the right direction. Yeah, because I I mean I don't I don't know what the fuck Misfits boxing he's doing right now, man. I mean I just I don't know who won. Like I mean obviously tag team boxing did get like some some interest on online, but like to have them like in the main event and like. Like, for example, Dean the Great's not fighting, like, Waleed, and they're, like, like, they've been talking about that fight forever, but instead Dean the Great's going to fight in some random fucking tag team match against two guys who go out and take a box. Like, just, I don't know what the fuck, who's making the match, making decisions over there, but I'm way more excited for Kingpin these days. But, you know, we'll have to see how things go, especially this weekend, because it is one of their, you know, um, it is only their second real major event, I guess I should say. Nonetheless, man. We do have one last thing to talk about. One last thing. Kevin Lee does not fit in the UFC. Kevin Lee, one week after his knockout, not, excuse me, not knockout, submission loss where he got put out cold, he has retired. Um, he said that there's more to life than fighting and that he's ready to begin a new chapter of his life. Angel, what do you think about the end of the career of the Motown Phenom? Hey man, if, if if that's what he wants to do, that's perfectly fine. You know, as long as you know he's living on his own terms, which is always a great thing. I mean, I just thought, dude, like the first fight back. I mean, they did not like this was very clear. They did not like Kevin Lee in some capacity because they did not give him a a good matchup back. I mean, this guy, dude, we're not for freaking Dean. That we're not for for I can't even fucking say it. we're not. It was a fucking killer, dude. We knew that. I even told you, I'm like, dude, this is, I, don't, I don't even know why they made this fight. Like, <laughs> what the fuck? This is not the fight to make. And uh I feel like uh for Kevin, dude, I mean he also has like I saw his legs were or his feet or legs were hella wrapped up, but his knees were hella wrapped up. But there's some stuff there. I feel like he's a little broken down too. Um and yeah, he beat Diego Sanchez, Josh, but let's be honest, a guy at his age and with how good he looked at what point in his career didn't beat Diego Sanchez the way a guy like the way he was once looked at should be beating Diego Sanchez. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, and that should have been a clear indicator for us. But, you know, we wanted to be hopeful. We're like, you know, something you just you need to get one back and, and kind of get on a roll. Uh, it, it just it just seemed like Kevin Lee was never going to get exactly back to where he once was. Whatever things led to that and added up to it, I don't know. But as long as he has the support on his own accord, then I think that's all that matters. And much luck to him in his career, you know, whatever his future endeavors are. And it will definitely be missed. I do think there was potential fights that could have been good and matchups that could have been interesting. I mean, shit, I think, like you said, the Tony fight at 170 with him could have been interesting. Uh, you know, uh, other guys there, there, there was there were some potential choices that just didn't end up going his way, and it's very sad because at one point in time, Kevin Lee looked like he could have been something very, very special. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man. I mean, it, it is a shame. It is a shame that... um they did. It went the way that it did because I remember Kevin Lee, man. I mean, he looked to be a future UFC champion, and like, look, he fought for an interim title. He had some very, very big fights. He had major knockouts, incredible moments. I mean, Kevin Lee is not a guy that is is like a lot of fans meme on him and a lot of fans dunk on him. But like, what is he? He's like, if you look at it from like, you know, he's like in the top one percent of most successful MMA fighters. You know what I mean? Like. He didn't reach the heights of being UFC champion, but he got damn close, dude. I mean, the Motown Phenom, hell of a career, man. I'm glad that he ended his career in the UFC. Um, that's like a minor thing, but I'm personally happy that that's, that ended up uh, happening that way. Um, and, and I'm not very surprised. I mean, I, I think after the way the way that that fight went with Renat, man, he, look, he looked like he could barely, I mean... 
he didn't look like an athlete out there. You know what I mean? He didn't look like Kevin Lee out there. He, I don't know who that was, but that was not the Motown phenom. You know what I mean? And I think he was aware of that, too. So, anyways, man. I think I, I think that's about it. I mean, hell of a career. Any closing thoughts before you want to go ahead and uh, close out here, man? No, nothing else, man. Obviously, sad to see, but obviously, to kind of look forward to Obviously, very excited for the fights this week as much as I can be. And for the and uh, next week, Josh was a banger. We're back in London. Tom Aspinall is back from injury, and after that, obviously UFC 291. And uh, you know, I, I completely forgot King Ping was going on, man. But I'm I'm actually very excited about it because last King Ping was a banger, and I think this one will be great too. So for anybody out there, I do definitely recommend you go check out King Ping because I think you'll be pleasantly surprised at the quality of combat you'll get there from from the influencers because. Uh, these guys and gals have been really been putting in the work and are getting significantly better. Especially, like I said, the main event, Kenny and, and Winners and Nunes. Those guys have got some fucking serious skills, and I think we're due for a very highly competitive matchup in there. You know, five three minute rounds, there's a lot that can go down in that, man. So definitely don't want to miss that. And obviously, uh, Jarvis and Gibb, don't blink. Mm. Yeah, man. Yeah. Very, very excited to see that card going down this weekend. I'm admittedly more excited for that card than I am for the UFC one. Right, um, a little, a little embarrassing, isn't it? Huh. I mean, I just, I, I, I just like. Okay, it's gonna sound weird, but like, do you, is it because it's entirely at the apex for you? Because I don't think it's like entirely that reason, but like that plays like a fifty percent role. I think. I, do, I don't think. If, I think this card could literally be in Jacksonville, Florida, and it wouldn't make me any more excited. Actually, well, I disagree. I disagree with that. Just, but I, you know what? No, I, I get no, it. it's still not a good no. card on paper either way. No, because you do actually you know something because if it was an action in Florida, the card would be better. You know, like they would have they would have put they would have put better fighters on the card. You got a good point. Yeah, the man, more, um, the more notable ones. There is a lot of combat to watch this weekend. Hopefully, you guys enjoy it. It's a big ass month for combat sports. It's a big year, so hope you guys enjoy it. And thanks for listening uh, to the podcast, man. We've been killing it on YouTube recently, man. We we hit a little. Admittedly, we hit a little bit of like a a uh, you know we hit a bit of a wall there. But since, you know, over the last, I guess, like, since the start of July, we've just been killing it, and that's all thanks to you guys. Like, we wouldn't have a show without you guys, and uh, we appreciate it, and we love you all. Thank you all for listening. I'm at Josh Evanoff on Twitter. He's at Angel Ortega on score 01, a courtside sound for all things related to the show. Peace and butt grease. Mouse click.